section. What the heck is a phallus? Do you think? Sorry, you did you ask him what is a phallus? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. You asked what is a phallus? I well, no, 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 with a V. No, no fuck you, penis. <laughs> penis. Yeah. 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 I'm so happy that that ended. <laughs> oh, that I walk into. <laughs> Is it too late to quit the university? No, yeah, yeah. yeah. No. Tell us the truth. <clears throat> so I'm gonna blow all of your minds. I'm going to reveal the inner secrets of the universe. Yay! Whoa! Yeah. You are going to know how to become God. Wait, are you Capital G, God. <laughs> like the one? I said it wrong. Okay. Right. Are, are you I already know. I'm a little you know, prepared. Like in general. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, this is going to be a lecture on Valis. Now that begs the question, what the hell is Valis? And it's important I clarify here, because there's a lot of confusion on the internet. Which is understandable, because Valis is a book. Valis is also the name of the prequel to said book. Valis is three distinct trilogies, one of which doesn't actually exist. Oh. Valis is an intentionally <laughs> underfunded multimedia corporation. Valus is a conspiracy, and Valus might literally be capital G God. What? So Valus is everything. Valus is all of those things. So when I say Valus, what in particular am I talking about? The lecture. All of it. Woo! I'm going to cover each one of those. And by the end of this lecture, you will understand the entire conspiracy. Woo! And by an hour in, you will know more than literally everybody on Reddit. So... Oh, Earth. The story starts with a man named Philip K. Dick. Yay! Now, Philip K. Hey, Dick let's go. is a sci-fi writer. Now, you might not know his books, but you definitely know the movie adaptations. He did the story for Blade Runner, oh, shit. Minority Report, Total Recall, Man in the High <laughs> Castle, Scanner Darkly, Yes, Roland. So are you saying that Philip K. Dick wrote the Phallus trilogy? <laughs> <laughs> Start my notebook that I keep the demeritum. So apart from that, you know, he was pretty normal for a sci-fi writer. His best friend was his sister who died yeah. oh, when no. she was a baby. Oh, uh, talked to her in his entire life. He thought the government was spying on him, and one day he came back home. The safe he wrote his stories in was blown up, and all of his notes were missing. It's fucked up. Oh, really? Yeah, he, this is a le He's not lying to you. <laughs> <laughs> he was divorced five times. Oh. <laughs> And in 1974, he met God. That's the incident. That, this is the incident. This is where it starts. Well, what do you mean by he met God, Professor? We will get into that. Okay. By the end of this, by the end of the next 10 minutes, you will know. Holy fuck. Yay. To quickly explain this board. So blue means something that really happened or a document describing something that really happened. Okay. Red is works of fiction. Orange is a work of fiction within another work of fiction. Oh my god. Now, it's important to clarify, because all of these things will influence each other and intermingle, so it's important to keep your head in what is real and what isn't. So starting out in 1974, Philip K. Dick is having a massive toothache, he just got his wisdom teeth extracted, and a woman comes to his place to deliver the pain medicine. She comes in, she's wearing the Christian fish sign necklace. The light reflects off of it, and then the pink light hits Philip K. Dick, and all of a sudden he starts having the seizure, where all of this information is suddenly implanted into his brain. When he comes back to, he's able to speak all sorts of dead languages, Greek, Roman, and he's never studied any of them. Next thing, he starts noticing that when he walks outside, he's no longer seeing Berkeley, California, where he lives. He's seeing um, first century Athens and Rome. <laughs> Two Hell things yeah. are just literally transposed on top of each other. Wait, what? <laughs> oh my god. Like, yes. as in, is this, did he do a lot of drugs before this? No. He okay. is very clear that he has never touched drugs. Big thing with him. When yes. you say transposed, does that mean that Athens and whatever the fuck California have fused together in their place? No, it's like superimposed on top of. Yeah, superimposed on top of. But what does that mean? Like... So, you walk outside and you see, like, the entire world of first century Athens, like it's another layer of film that's got the transparency down. So you see both at the same time. Like, you know when you go into Photoshop oh, okay. and you t put two photos on top of each yes, other and one's at half transparency? Yeah. Okay, I got you. Yeah. yeah. 
Next, he starts realizing that he's having the instincts and memories of another person. Oh. Um, all of a sudden, all of his uh, food tastes change, and he starts realizing that he's having the exact same preferences as his friend James Pike. James Pike is a bishop that we will get way further into. Yay! I like that. Next thing, the day he has his um, religious 1974 experience, all of his animals die. Wait, his pets? Both of his pets, dead. Okay. His cat and his dog are gone. Oh, shit. Wait, they just disappeared? No, their bodies were just found dead. Like, He's convinced that it's radiation poisoning from God, but... It has wait, relate. how does that relate? <laughs> I'm assuming it will, but... Uh, don't give too much credence to that yet. Okay. And here's the part that really gets interesting. So, God contacts him one more time. One night, he's sitting alone, the pink light envelops him, and he is told his baby kid, Christopher, has a terminal illness. Uh -oh. A weirdly specific illness. So he takes his kid to the doctor, and then tells the doctor what's in it, and he's exactly right. So all of a sudden, Philip K. Dick is shitting his pants. <laughs> remember, this guy is not quite mentally stable to begin with. But he's like, actually, like, is there actually poo in his pants, or was that an expression? <laughs> that was an expression. <laughs> Philip K. Dick, I would not be surprised. Right. <laughs> I don't know. This guy's seeing Athens in California at the same yeah, time. I would have put shitting in his pants <laughs> behind him. At what point in his career was this? So, this is pretty late in his career. But he is not famous yet. Is he still Nobody, alive? No. Oh. Nobody knows who Phil K. Dick is outside of like heavy, heavy sci-fi nerds. So he, he's like a minor celebrity. But after this experience happens, he literally cannot bring himself to write anything that's not about him meeting God. Every story he writes for the rest of his life is just a variation on what happened here. So he pitches his first book, Valus System A to his publisher. His publisher looks through this and goes, what the fuck is this? <laughs> <laughs> You're fucking losing it. No, we're not publishing this unless you change everything. Yes. Wait, so if he was unable to write anything else unless it related to Valus, does that mean like all his other works he's known for were inspired by Valus? All of his other works he's known for were before this. Oh, okay. okay. Once this happened, he realized all of that was uninspired shit, and is now <laughs> writing about God. Okay, okay. Loser, you know, low-budget sci-fi stuff, not worthy of his greatness. Yeah. Alright. So, publisher says, change everything. He says, you know, at that point, I'm just gonna write another book. And so he writes Valis. 1981 is the first we hear about any of this. The rest of the time, he is just working on these two books. Now, this is weird, because Phil K. Dick has notoriously been, like, a very prolific writer. He would write four novels in a year. So he Jesus. disappears, 1974. Oh. Nothing from him until 1981, and then it's odd. So, normally I'd start you off here, but this book is actually a direct prequel to Valis. So we are going to open with Valis System A, later republished in 1985 as Radio Free Album Us. But we need to be careful with this version because it was published with the permission of the PKD Estates. Boo! We will learn more about the PKD Estate later on, but they are the big bad guy of this lecture. Oh boy. Uh oh. Who <clears throat> bitches? So, Valve System A. We start in. Do -do 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 -do, Berkeley, California. So for those of you who don't know, Berkeley is like kind of where that uh, major university in California is. It was a major site for um, protests and civil change in the 60s. And this is when Phil Pick was kind of growing up and relevant. So <clears throat> the whole is writing about how Berkeley is a shitty place to live. It's calling all like the college kids who live there like lazy, uninspired liberals. Uh oh. <laughs> but he also hates like the conservative. He's just like these people just do nothing but go to college and talk endlessly about making change and then never do anything with their life. Like adults just keep going to classes even after they've graduated to be part of this university culture. And so he makes no mistakes in the first like few pages of book that Berkeley is horrible. Our main character is named. Nicholas Brady. 
Nicholas Brady was born in this town, and so after he graduated high school, he had no idea what he was going to do with his life, so he decided, fuck it, I'll go to Berkeley, right? That's just what's near here, that's what people do. He had no money, so he got in through ROTC. The first time he picked up a gun, he was like, well, this sucks, and he just dropped it and refused to fire, so he gets kicked out of college. <laughs> 19, no prospects, living in Berkeley, he decides to work at a record store and just kind of bums out as an assistant manager for like 10, 12 years. His girlfriend is studying to be, like, a lawyer, and she's getting her second doctorate degree. So everyone kind of thinks she's going places, but Phil Kiddick keeps putting notes and saying, but fuck her. As you'll know, there's weird notes of misogyny through everything Philip Kiddick writes. And he's like, she's trapped in this Berkeley system where she'll never stop educating herself. So point is, this couple is kind of locked in this, like, mundane Berkeley lifestyle. So one day, FBI agents come to the door and ask Nicholas, Hey, so we think your uh, wife might be with the communists. <laughs> now is a good time to point out that this takes place in an alternate Earth. Oh. Oh, no, never mind. I thought... Okay. The president is Ferris F. Fremont. So, about the time when MLK was assassinated, pretty much every ma major player in U.S. politics disappears, gets killed. He has a whole part about James Pike, that bishop... Philip Kiddick was talking about earlier, he gets killed as part of this giant conspiracy to get Ferris F. Fremont into the presidency. Now, Ferris F. Fremont's whole platform is something called a ram check. So, his whole argument is communism is out there and communism is bad, right? But there is a whole inside group of communists in the United States called a ram check. They're responsible for drugs, juvenile delinquency, sex, everything wrong. Uh oh. <laughs> so, this, they're going to be a double front war. We are going to aggressively kill everyone in Vietnam. By the way, in this universe, America is ten times worse than we were. We are no jokes about it, just killing innocent civilians over there, not even pretending. Oh, okay. It, it, there, there's definitely some commentary going on. And at home, it is this oppressive regime where every night you have to watch the president speak and take a test. And if you do not pass it, you fail your citizenship attention thing, <laughs> and you get taken away into a detention cell. Ooh. Oh How do you so, get out? Hmm? How do you get out of you, there? You, you don't. You're just there forever? <laughs> you don't get, here. like, reprogrammed. Oh, this isn't like, this isn't like a prison. This is like an assassin. Yeah, okay. you, you, uh, Death. You, you end up probably in a work camp, but people don't know where you go. How okay. hard are the tests? Very easy. So you just have to watch it? You have to sit there, and you have to watch it, and you have to put in the, like, politically correct responses. What if you're, like, what if you're, like, have a mental disability? This is the 1970s. Fuck you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, could you say that right into the camera, please? This is the 1970s. Fuck you. All Thank right. you. So. <clears throat> <laughs> you're such a little actor. The FBI agents come to the door, and he's like, we, we think your wife is involved in a ram check. And he's like, fuck, that's bad, closes it on him, and walks away. And so he's kind of suspecting his wife, but he's also like, am I against the communists? How about we just don't talk about it? That night, when Nicholas Brady's going to bed, he sees a hologram of himself. Look at him, touch him. The second his wife wakes up, the hologram disappears. So Nicholas is like, okay, well that's fucking weird. Especially since it's the same day the FBI agents come around. So he does the only thing he knows how. He calls his science fiction writer buddy, Philip K. Dick. <laughs> <laughs> now here's where I'd like to mention. This got adapted into a movie in 2010, also really? from the PKD estate. And in the movie, Philip K. Dick is like this sex appeal badass. He wants to <laughs> I don't remember. Someone you've never heard of. This is not a well-known movie. But he walks in and everybody loves Philip K. Dick. Like, women are falling over him. It's hilarious. Yes. Like, is, is, ah, uh, shoot. How big, I mean, not that, but like, what was the quality of this movie, would you say? Horrible. <laughs> All right, no I'm more. I'm not going to say penny for your thoughts, but. <laughs> <laughs> So, in the book, however, Phil Kiddick is a complete loser. 
Something you should know, in all of his books, Phil K. Dick's a miserable excuse for a human being. <laughs> he just sits there and wallows and I'm divorced and sad and life is hard. Yes. What's- is the movie really called Valis Movie? No, it's called Radio Free Album Okay. Okay, okay, yeah. That, okay, that's- okay, got it. <laughs> all of- uh, so guy? many of these things are called Valis <laughs> that I just gave them different names so that they're- Is that him? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. This is him. This is him. <laughs> that's true. No, can you show the camera? He kind of looks like Tyler. Like Tyler. We'll put an image up, don't worry. Okay. Well, we'll put an image up like in, in, in costume for the actual watcher. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, so he calls up his friend Philip K. Dick. And Philip K. Dick at the time is writing Minority Report. In, in the book, not in real life. In real life he already wrote it, right? Yes. Okay. So, Philip K. Dick says, Well, it probably has to do with precog, since that's what I'm writing about. And that this, that makes sense. So then Philip Kiddick gives him this whole lecture about how, like, precogs are, like, this deep, meaningful thing and you should be scared. And Nicholas is like, well, but th what about this is precog? And Philip Kiddick is just, shut up and listen to me, I'm talking. Yes. Quick explanation of what precog means? Someone who can see into the future. Oh, okay. cock. Cock, yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're seeing into your future, so. <laughs> for the for next while, Phil Kiddick and Nicholas just meet every day and talk to each other and come up with new theories about what this hologram could have been. Well then all of a sudden, every single night, Nicholas starts dreaming and he goes to this pink light computer zone and it just starts teaching him shit. So he wakes up the next day and he knows new languages, he knows bits about ancient history, he knows things about engineering, he's like, I have no idea how or why I know this stuff. And so they're coming up with crazy shit. They think it might be him from an alternate universe giving him information. They decide that he's probably trying to give them information to take down Ferris F. Fremont because they're telling him about the inner workings of the government and how to make weapons and stuff. So they're like, okay, so clearly they want us to overthrow. We don't know why. Then one day, let me make sure I'm not missing anything. Oh yeah, he notices that he gets clearer <laughs> dreams and learns more when the weather is clear and when he's higher up. So... They're, they're, they, they can measure how effective these things are. So there's, there's a physical thing going on. How effective the precogs are, or what? There's no precogs. Wait, but what what is getting more clear? The dreams. Oh, okay. His dreams in which he's getting valus beamed information are getting increasingly clear if it's clear weather and he's higher up. Okay. Then one day, when he like really focuses in and gets the perfect dream, he sees himself moving to Los Angeles. And he goes, you know what? Fuck it. If the dream machine wants me to go to Los Angeles, I'll do it. So he goes to his wife and says, hey, remember when you were getting two doctor degrees? Yeah, fuck you, we're moving. <laughs> and this is phrased as a good thing, because remember, <laughs> <laughs> and later on the wife has this whole section about how, like, I gave up college for you and I have a kid, and that is the most complex female character you are going to see until here. Yay! Oh. Is this, is this real life or a movie? What, the incident you just described. That is the plot of the book. Okay. So is this sort of because I'm I'm see, I'm hearing some parallels like with the pink light like computer dream. So is this kind of a story about himself, but not? Yeah. Okay. Yes. And this is after he after the 1974 yeah. incident. This is so the first book he wrote Odysseus immediately book. after the publisher said no, crushed his dream, which was this book, and then he settled and wrote this one instead. Okay. Which is a sequel to this, so you don't know quite what's going on unless you've read this one. Have you? Yes. Wonderful. <laughs> Where was it? How did you find it if it wasn't published? Um, this one was republished as this, and you can get easy annotated note copies from different things on Reddit that just tell you what's different, okay. and then get this. This was not hard to get a hold of. So, they moved to Los Angeles. Um, Philip K. Dick leaves Berkeley too, because Berkeley is evil. They, um, and Nicholas Brady ends up getting a job at a major record studio. So now he's in charge of signing on new artists. All right. So now, the FBI agents come back. And they go, all right, now that you're in this important position, we want you to start scanning for communists. Because communists oftentimes make good music and accidentally get on the airways <laughs> and put on, like, subliminal messages. So, <laughs> if you rat out any communists that come in, we'll give you like a thousand dollars per thing. So Nicholas obviously doesn't want to do this because he's going to be expected to rat out so many people or they're going to like suspect him. 
But he's also like, if I say no to this, this is going to look bad. And again, I'm working with aliens who want to take over the government, so I should play it as safe as possible. So he says yes. Philip K. Dick finds out about this and fucking flips out. He's like, I can't trust you anymore. You're going to report me to the government for writing science fiction stories. And he screams and has a fit. That night, uh, two FAP agents come over to Philip K. Dick's house. What is a FAP agent? What does the sentence spell it? F-A-P. Jesus Christ! In this universe, FAP is an alternate government branch that starts for Friends of the American People. Oh my God. <laughs> Every time FAP agents show up in the book, Phil Payton, the character, laughs, ha ha ha, FAP, and they go, please stop doing that. Professor, yes. we're never going to get through these lectures if everyone laughs at the most mundane mundane humor possible. No, but well, like the I'm surrounded. sorry you're dead inside and don't like penis jokes rolling. But we have we have Vallis that sounds very phallic. Why is there so much penis in the We have K Dick and now we have <laughs> fat agent. We have so, so wait, so, so he so he as the author is aware of the, the fat yes. joke. And his character is making fun of them for it. And they're like, please stop. Okay, okay. We're serious government agents. <laughs> <laughs> so the okay. two people who come by the door, they're like... It could have been F.A. <laughs> <laughs> like, young, upstanding people, it's one young man and one young woman. And they say, we've recently come in contact to your friend Nicholas Brady. He seems interesting. We want you to write a report on him, just to say if there's anything suspicious. So Philip Kiddick's like, shit, they're onto us, and he freaks out. So in his infinite wisdom, he's starting to think, like, how can I get out of this, right? So what he does is he calls the female fat member. He's going to seduce her into getting out of... Which, the context in the book when he's a complete loser is so much funnier than when in the movie and he's supposed to be cool. So he says, look, I'm having trouble writing this report because I'm a fiction writer, not a non-fiction writer, you know. So could you send her just to come by and help me take notes? So she comes in, and the first thing she does is pulls out a joint and starts smoking it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now, drugs are very, very illegal in this conservative hell America, right? So Philip Kiddick's like, whoa, that's <laughs> weird. And she's like, do you want a hit? And he's like, well, no, because if I take a hit, you're going to report me for drug use, and then I'm done. <clears throat> And then she's like, fair enough, but you're fucking paranoid. You know, the only reason I went to see you is because I knew you did drugs, and I figured it, you wouldn't tell on me so I could smoke here. And then he goes on a page-long rant in this book about why he never did drugs. <laughs> at any point. Just because he writes about meth heads and psychedelics does not mean I'm a drug addict. Please stop telling me that I do drugs. And it's weirdly, like, personal. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> we get through this rant, and then he seduces her, right? And right before they're about to fuck, she mentions that she's in high school. Just uh -oh. This has happened to you before. <laughs> <laughs> so he's like, shit, you're 17? Oh. They always taught me for fucking a minor. And so he starts panicking, right? But then oh my God. he finds her wallet, and her ID says she's 23, and he's like, wait a second, I could have fucked you. And she says, haha, and then leaves. God, oh God. 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 Fucking loser. Oh, wait, I forgot, I forgot. Uh. So at first he's trying to, like, seduce her so that, like, he doesn't have to report on his friend, right? Halfway through this completely flips, and she's just seducing him, and he flat out tells her everything. Very cool. <laughs> He's like, by the way, my friend talks to God, and uh, this. this is still a book, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> we we will get to the stuff that's not a book. No, it, okay. It's just hard to distinguish. So where are we right now on the map? Here, right okay. there. We're on Valis System A. Gotcha, gotcha. Everything okay. read is fiction. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yay. Okay, so and then she goes. So what? He talks to God. That means nothing to us. We want to know like if he's part of a Ram check or any communist party. And he goes, oh, wait, I don't have to hide anything from you? Great, let's fuck. And that's how that happened. Ugh. So, two interesting things with going back to Nicholas Brady. He has a dream where all of a sudden he gets in contact with the thing that's talking to him through a computer interface. And he types in something called, where are you? And it says, Walloon. 
And he goes, where is that? And he replies, the Portuguese States of America. So him and Philip K. Dick start talking about their theory on this. They think this machine is probably from an alternate universe where the Catholics took over and there was never a Protestant Reformation, so there was never a big war in Europe, so technology got farther. But the, and then they spitball theories for pages and pages and pages. Next dream Nicholas has is that he sees this beautiful woman named Sylvia who walks up to him, sings him a song, and then he wakes up. And he's like, shit, that is the prettiest song I've ever heard. He goes to work next day, and a woman who looks just like Sylvia applies for a job. And so he's like, but she's applying for like a secretary position, because she has no musical background. And he starts like aggressively trying to get her to become a singer, because he saw her in a dream, and he's like, oh, this is part of the Valis conspiracy connected. Especially when he finds out what Sylvia's last name is. A ram check. Uh, oh. I get it. Oh. Then, the next night he gets another dream. This dream orders him to take Philip K. Dick and his wife over to the birthplace of Ferris F. Fremont, who just happened to also be born in California. Not fun. So they drive over and they go to his house and they go through like the bullshit conservative tour. And while they're walking, they notice in the sidewalk next to his house, <coughs> there's a word, a ram check, carved in the ground. So the dots are starting to connect. The leading theory amongst the Berkeley people right now is that there's no such thing as a ram check that he just saw this word on the ground and created a fake enemy, so anything he did in America was justified to, like, bring his fascist regime, but we don't know. Alright. I'm sure I'm not missing anything before I move on. Okay, so the rest of this is just Nicholas aggressively following Sylvia. Eventually, she agrees to work with him. At some point, he takes her out to dinner and goes, Okay, full disclosure, I talk to God, right? And God said, your job is to help me kill the president. She looks at him and just walks out. <laughs> She's like, what, what the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> Something else worth being noticed. Nicholas is slowly being possessed by Valis. Every time he has this dream, he's learning that he's having less control over what he does every day, and his actions are guided more and more without his free willpower by what he was told to do the night before. So he's, like, slowly becoming less and less of himself, and he's, like, excited for the point where he's no longer here and Valis takes control of his body. He's, like, he can't wait for God to fill him. It's getting weird. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds almost Catholic. Next, alien life is discovered. Newspapers everywhere point out that they just found a satellite in space that has been beaming massive amounts of information right over to Los Angeles and before it was Berkeley, California. So Nicholas comes home and his wife is like, look, this is a satellite that's been talking to you. This entire time, the wife character has been convinced that none of this is real. And Nicholas and Philip Kiddick have just been, you know, fuck you, you're stupid, why don't you believe in aliens, you dumb bitch. That's just kind of been the attitude. <laughs> so all of a sudden, she goes, hey guys, do you think that satellite might be the thing causing it? And Philip Kiddick looks at her and says, no, we thought it was a th satellite earlier. We moved past that theory. And they go back and keep talking about the alternate universe Portugal. What? We were talking about that before? Yeah. Is Portugal the US, US territory? Portugal states no. in America. Portugal is right below Spain. Silly boy. Oh, so why did... I thought you said earlier it was something. Okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, eventually... Nicholas just accepts that his wife is right, and that this satellite probably is the thing being in information. Right when this happens, the U.S. government sends a nuclear missile and blows it up. Oh. They don't say why. Huh. Satellite gone. Now, in the book, um, Nicholas is heartbroken because now he's like, fuck, I'm never going to take down the president. Everything's horrible. This is scary. In the movie, there's a very important difference. Nicholas here is afraid because he realizes that um, he felt special talking to Valis, and that was a thing that like made him better than everyone else, and even if Valis wasn't real, he needed to believe that it was because that was part of him. And that's a reflection that we're not going to see with Philip K. Dick. So the fact that that distinction happened is important. Take note. Moving on, now that the sh uh, thing is blown up, uh, Sylvia randomly pulls uh, Nick aside and says, Okay, sorry I couldn't talk earlier. People were listening. 
I'm from a ram check. And he's like, well, no shit. And uh, she explains that last name. <laughs> <laughs> a ram check's entire deal is that they are in contact with an alien life form that's going to come and stop. All right, so a ram check. Uh, okay, so there is an alien intelligence out there somewhere, alternate universe, and it has discovered that the universe they are in right now is the worst universe of all of them. <laughs> there is nothing worse than this. We're in the worst possible timeline. This is, God damn it. <laughs> this, is, this is some community type stuff. I'm loving it. Okay. And so this machine is just sending information over to help them out. And it's going to take profits, take over them, start this revolution, get rid of Ferris F. Remos. And he's like, okay, this is good. So what's the plan? And she says, well, it's going to take them 1,200 years to send over another satellite. So that plan's gone. Our only hope now is to put a secret message in the music to awaken the evil in everyone, and then all of a sudden they'll wake up, realize what's going on, and get rid of Ferris F. Remos. And he's like, okay, so we need to put an undercover musician. They write a song, and they get a band to play it, right? And they're just going to sneak it onto the airwaves. Right when he records... A woman walks into Nick's office. The same woman from FAP that PKD was dealing with earlier. And she goes, hey, so you know how sometimes people like to put secret messages in music? Yeah, don't do that. Or things will go poorly for you. And Nick's thinking, well, God's on my side. What possibly could go wrong, right? And he accidentally slips up and says it. And then she goes, oh, you think you're talking to God? Really? Okay, well, let's look at this. There is an alien that is slowly taking you over. And the alien wants to do this to other people. This is called an alien invasion. And you think this is a bad thing? Which, by the way, up until this point, we had no idea that she believed that he talked to God or any of this. So all of a sudden, he's scared shitless. And she goes, okay, by the way, if I come back and there's a secret message on this tape, I will kill all of you. And she walks out. So... Um, they put a secret message on the tape. <laughs> <laughs> Got him! And so she comes back to steal it, but they switched out the disc, so she gets the one without the secret message on it. But it turns out none of that matters, because they've been bugging all of these people the entire time. Oh my god. So, they release, they try to release a secret message, it gets stopped, they pull Philip K. Dick, Sylvia, and Nicholas all into a room, and go, okay. They pull out a gun and shoot Nicholas. Nicholas is dead. Now they kill Sylvia. Sylvia's dead. And they look at Philip K. Dick and go, all right, so you never technically betrayed us. You just were in association with them. So here's your deal. You're going to spend the rest of your life as a slave, but you're too public of a figure to like disappear. So we're going to write the rest of your books for you. And each book is slowly going to come closer to a Christian conservative point of view. And eventually we will save the souls of all of your lost drug addicts fans. And Philip K. Dick is like, stop calling me a drug addict, I don't do drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Priorities. So they ship him to this, like, slave worker place. Which, by the way, is not secret. He's just out in the open in California. He's working on buildings. People are walking past. Just nobody cares. And here he makes friends with a priest. And everyone at this camp is all talking about a ram check. Because they're all accused of being members. And none of them, like, were. And so Philip K. Dick is like, all right, I know what a ram check is, I'll tell you. But nobody believes him, of course. And the priest comes by and says, all right, look, I used to be part of a ram check, right? Here's the problem with that. It's too focused on the world later. You know, you think your friends are in a better place now because they've worked with God, but that doesn't matter. We need to see immediate results here. While he's saying that, they overhear the song that they created with the secret message in it. It turns out a different record company made it with a bigger group. They were the decoy, so the government was looking somewhere else. That was Vallis' master plan all along. And so Philip K. Dick is like, fuck, I'm a slave, my career and legacy is ruined, but at least the message is out. Vallis System A, everybody. Oh, that's how it ends? Oh, shit. You, you can see why the publisher wasn't big on this one. Yeah. <laughs> and now here's where I wanted to kind of talk about my personal history with Vallis. So I discovered Philip K. Dick in middle school. <laughs> And essentially ripped off all of his stories for like, uh, my middle school sci-fi inspiration. And then I got to Vallis and thought it was so fucking shitty that I wrote an entire essay about why this was the worst book ever written. 
<laughs> now you're doing a presentation. <laughs> Sorry, I should <laughs> so this thing is long and rambly, but the highlight is I said that, first of all, putting yourself in a book is evil and horrible and you should never do it. And also, I was, like, super, super, like, militantly Christian. I was like, and he talks about God and doesn't respect him properly, and so Philip K. Dick is going to hell. <laughs> <laughs> and that's my essay. Yay! <laughs> Did then share it with us? Can you put a link in the description? Yo, yeah, I'll put a link to the description. It'll oh be <laughs> Yay! Valis is personally one of my favorite books, but it is also slow, but we need to go through all of this to get to this blue line where shit gets real. This is where it gets interesting, as you wrote on the board. That is where it gets interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, let's see, is there anything I need the to cover between crooked. this and Valis? Oh, it's it's very crooked, I've just been letting um. it go. I, that's, and then, <laughs> just keep it like my that. Letters are imbalanced. Is really making me tweet. <laughs> Fuck. Fucking bubble letters. So Valis opens. He gets a call from his friend Glory, and she asks, um, "Hey, do you have any pain meds?" And he says, "Why?" And she says, "Well, I'm trying to kill myself, and I want to take like 70 at once just to be safe, and I only have like 45. So can you just hand me some?" <laughs> And he goes, <laughs> Sorry, I think you skipped over our protagonist's name there. Yeah, oh, where sorry. are we? We're, is, we just started Valis. This is the okay. beginning. This okay. is the first sentence of the book. This is where it starts. Okay. Oh, wait, that's like verbatim? Yeah. Oh, okay. Is that the sequel to System A? Yeah. yeah. Okay. This is the sequel to System A. Okay. Or, the person who gets this call is Horse Lover Fat. Oh! And so... <laughs> wait, yeah. can, wait. can you repeat that? Horse... Lover fat. Horse lover fat. Okay. That, that is his name. That is his name. Why is it in a bracket? This is the official Valis trilogy. Remember okay. I said there was three? This is like the canon one. Okay. Well, we'll get to that. Alright, so... Horse lover fat is like, well, I like Gloria, so I don't want her to kill herself, but I'm going to say yes, get her over here, and then I'm going to lecture her about why she couldn't shouldn't kill herself. Okay. So that's exactly what he does. And she gets over here and he goes, and let's start talking about who Horse Lover Fat is. He is basically Philip K. Dick. He's been yeah. divorced like three times. Horse Lover Fat is on meth. Oh. Like for real? And not like the character, yeah. So he's not Philip K. Dick at all. No, Philip K. Dick doesn't do drugs at all. <laughs> Hell yeah! <laughs> Horse Lover Fat, however, who is Philip K. Dick standing for himself, Big meth head. <laughs> just like, I try meth at parties is like, I can't go a day without I try meth. meth at parties? I try, I try meth at parties. He <laughs> <laughs> you just like party meth? <laughs> he, he, he has a serious problem. So he goes over and is like, uh, fuck, uh, you, you know, I'd feel bad if you killed yourself. That, that would make me feel horrible and fuck me up. Don't do that. And he just tries to guilt her into staying alive. And she goes, uh, the, no. Oh, he also suggests, you know what? Y you don't, you want to die, right? How about we just get together and be a relationship? Because you're really hot. And and we could live together, and then you wouldn't have to kill yourself. So she kills herself. Oh. <laughs> Pretty much like, oh, don't kill yourself. You're so Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we come to... Horse Lover Fat crying about this with his friends. <laughs> horse Lover Fat. <laughs> now, Horse Lover Fat and his friends are called the Ripidon Society. All of them are unemployed, have no life, they pretty much do nothing but sit in coffee shops and talk about philosophy all day. This is based off of Philip K. Dick's real friend group. <laughs> and he paints none of these people well. He's intentionally calling these people out. <laughs> well, he doesn't paint himself very well. No, he, he doesn't paint himself well. So, one second. The first person is Kevin. Kevin is a cynical asshole, believes everything is horrible, and his big thing is God is an asshole and I hate him. Yeah. No, God, isn't, God doesn't exist and I hate him. That's his big thing. So he's constantly arguing against God because if God was real, he can't exist. And his big argument is, I had a cat, right? <laughs> I loved my cat. My cat was the only thing that mattered to me. And then one day the cat wandered into a street and got hit by a car. Why the fuck would God do that? Fuck God. Didn't Philip K. Dick's cat die too? Yes. Yeah. From God. Yeah, Indeed. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, every time they try to talk about anything, Kevin will just randomly barge in and go, what about my cat? <laughs> Everyone hates him. 
Fuck so, that. David is a ridiculously stringent Catholic, and will always be trying to convert you to Catholicism, and everybody hates him. Yes. Oh, I was... Okay. That wasn't really my hand. Sherry. Now, this is a female character, so get ready for this. Uh, <clears throat> oh, boy. She is also Christian, except she's not smart enough to really understand everything Christianity's about. Oh. She just wants to fuck her pastor. <laughs> and because she wants to fuck her pastor, she's, like, weirdly fallen into the how deep this religion thing can go. She's also dying from cancer. Oh. Jeez. Oh. Woo! <laughs> so in two months, she's gonna die. Does she get some before she dies? Hmm? Does she get some before she dies? Not from the priest. Damn. <laughs> so she's about That's to die. That's so sad. Then oh, she loses her house. Oh my god. Oh, the oh priest god. is horrible because he's like, she's really involved in the church and he wants to keep her around. So he never like flat out rejects her and talks to her. He just oh. kind of like leads her on. Okay. That's and everybody's great. telling Man. Sherry that like this priest is no good for you. You need to like get Can't a leg. Can priests not do that? Yeah, they're not supposed to. Also, Sherry is so into this priest that she just curses everybody out for not being as moral as him. Oh. So she's really <laughs> angry and bitter. But part of that is, again, she's going to die in two months. She's in constant pain. Things aren't going well for her. This is just what she's doing with her time left on Earth. Yes. <laughs> she's volunteering at things, yelling at people for not being as moral as a priest, and then being like, priest, will you fuck me, please? <laughs> Philip Kiddick is not great at writing women. We know. So, <laughs> we know. I, I want to put that out there. So, she loses her house. Things are bad. And so, she moves in with Horse Lover Fat. Hmm. Why does he name that? I can't give it We'll get to that. Okay. Wait, who Sorry. moves in again? Was it the, the Catholic girl? Cancer. Cancer girl. Okay, yeah. Cancer girl. <laughs> Got it. You can call her Catholic girl. <laughs> <laughs> or Sherry. How old Sherry. is Sherry? All That's of these awesome. people are in their, like, mid-30s, mid-40s. And who is this based off in real life and how accurate is it? Like, did he have a friend that had cancer? Yes, we don't know how accurate all of this is. Okay. Philip K. Dick and some people say this is all completely accurate. <laughs> these people say not accurate at all. Okay. The truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Okay. So, another thing. Horse lover... F oh, the most important person in friendly I forgot to mention. Philip K. Dick, the sci-fi writer. Oh, uh, yay! <laughs> How can we forget? So all of them have accepted at this point that um, Horse Lover Fat has met God. This happened seven oh. years ago. Yeah. Is this like the same Philip K. Dick from the end of the Alice System one? No. It's a oh. different Philip K. Dick. Oh, okay. so is this the same timeline or no? no. Uh-oh. This is a, this is how is this a sequel? We'll get to that. Okay. This is a timeline where you name your child Horse Lover Fat. <laughs> okay. Or Horse Lover Fat. So somehow we're not, thankfully we're not in the worst timeline as we've established before. This is not the worst timeline. <laughs> so so this is slightly better at the very least. Yeah. Hell yeah. We rolled a two essentially. Yeah. <laughs> so everyone is kind of tired of Phil K. Dick talking about. By the way, seven years or not Phil K. Dick Horse Lover Fat is always talking about seven years ago, did you know I met God? And he's pink? And they're like, yes. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> I think it's going to get sense. All of these people hate each other. But they talk and hang out and talk about religion for pages anyways. Another thing. Horse Lover Fat is writing something called the Exegesis. So every night, Horse Lover Fat comes home, and he's like, my friends won't listen to me, so I'll write my own information about God. <laughs> and he starts pouring out all of these theories about how... Valus, which in this he's calling Zebra. I have no idea why. <clears throat> zebra is like a future evolved human, maybe, who's talking back through time to try to guide him. He has no idea what's going on. It turns out this exegesis is real. Now, we always heard about it from here, but when we went through Philip Kiddick's stuff after he died, we found tens of thousands of pages where he just scribbled stuff about his religious experience. Apparently, he would write hundreds of pages a night. I was able to get a copy of a thousand pages of this document. Where the rest of it went, the PKD state is locking it up. Fuck but them. from the thousand pages I saw, I was able to get some very interesting insight into what Philip Kiddick was doing. And we will give what really happened as this goes on. Alright. So, he moves in with Sherry Solver. Sherry takes out all of her anger on Horse Lover Fat. Mm -hmm. She just tells him, you're a piece of shit, you're doing nothing with your life, you should be more like my priest every day. <laughs> At the same time, 
somehow Horse Lover's Fat ex-wife calls up, says stuff about their kid, and makes him so depressed that he has no choice but to go kill himself. It is completely his ex-wife's fault. <laughs> Fuck her. Women are evil. Alright, so he ends up in this mental institution, right? And he's thinking, I need to be very careful to not talk about God here, or I'm never leaving. So this entire time, he's like, don't talk about God, don't talk about God. The first psychiatrist he meets, within two pages, he's like, by the way, did you know I met God? <laughs> and then he starts saying, I have this exegesis too, thousands of pages of detailed notes to save all of humanity. And the psychiatrist goes, you too? <laughs> <laughs> so they both sit down. This psychiatrist has not been talking to God, but he's obsessed with Eastern philosophy and this guy called Lao Tzu. Phil, our, uh, horse lover Fat is obsessed with Gnostic mythology. Now, do any of you know what uh, Gnosticism is? No. Yeah. All right. Uh, there's you just want, like you an iffy. No. Okay. <laughs> Isn't it like mysticism, like medieval myst magic type? Earlier shit? than medieval. Oh, it's like like magic, like um, fucking rising sun. So, Christianity happens, and um, a new monotheistic religion is in the world, right? But Christianity's still really underground. Romans are hunting them. Christianity spreads down farther south in kind of like the Middle East, and that's where Zoroastrianism still has a hold. Kind of that, uh, that's a uh, monotheistic religion that really believes in like, yeah. I don't think Zoroastrianism is monotheistic. It is. Okay, okay then I don't know much about it. Right. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know a lot about Freddie Mercury. stupid, hang on, I thought... <laughs> And essentially, Gnostics combined Christian imagery with a lot of pagan beliefs, and were like, Jesus was misunderstood, and he's a pagan prophet. Despite the fact that they're monotheists, you can believe in one. It's weird. It was. I'm a genius. You are a genius, Michaela. Alright. Okay, so over the course of, like, the last minute, I have called Gnosticism a early offshoot of Christianity, I've called it a pagan religion, I've called it a kind of advanced stage Zoroastrianism, which kind of makes my explanation the most confusing one on the internet. So I'm just gonna try again here. So, first of all, Gnosticism is not a centralized religion. It's kind of a word that was invented by Christians to describe a group of people they wanted to separate themselves from, but Gnosticism itself is full of various people's various beliefs, but it is all kind of uh, centered in this kind of Middle Eastern area. Um, it is essentially combining a lot of early Christian tenets with Neoplatonism, Neoplatonism, oh boy, okay, <clears throat> Neoplatonism in essence is a philosophical idea saying that you need to come closer to the spiritual truth by self-discipline and study. It's kind of a more stoic version of Buddhism, and this combined with Christianity, and so it's all about like secret knowledge and waking yourself up and kind of being your true spiritual self. It's weird and iffy because, again, Gnosticism is not one thing, but the concept of Neoplatonism and Christianity combining, and it often plays with Zoroastrianism symbols just because it's in kind of that same region, and Philip K. Dick played with a lot of the symbology that came out of the secret texts like the Gospel of Thomas that that kind of culture religion wrote. I hope that clarifies things. It's really hard to clarify Gnosticism because most of what they wrote is lost and they were all about secret knowledge, so that makes things complicated, but yeah, that's kind of what we think their deal is. But at a certain point, it doesn't matter what their deal is for context of this lecture, we just need to know what Philip K. Dick thought their deal was and who the fuck knows what Philip K. Dick was thinking, so yeah. Alright, enjoy the lecture. Alright, so they compare notes on their different philosophies, and then uh, the doctor decides to release Phil or Horse Lover Fat. Horse Lover Fat at the end is asks, like, so now that we've talked, do you, like, get the meaning of life? Did this help at all? And the doctor turns to him and says, I don't know, you're the expert. And all of a sudden, he, like, feels so much better. All of his depression and wanting to himself is gone. That is the one phrase that could heal his heart. So, after that, he gets another message from Vallis for the first time in seven years. 
Vala says, the savior is born. I'm coming, I'm being born as a child, find me. So Horse Lower Fat goes, all right, well, China has the most people in it, so I'm um, just gonna fly there. Oh. I don't have a question, I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> so he announces this to his friend group in the morning, and they go, why are you flying to China? This is a horrible idea. And Philip K. Dick pulls Horse Lover Fat aside personally and is like, all right, just give it three days. If God doesn't contact you by then and tell you something else, I'll let you go to China. Just stay here. While this is happening, all of a sudden their friend Kevin, the cynical asshole with the cat guy, he finds this movie that is in, very inspired by the wall. It's like this film's version of it. And says, this is an experimental sci-fi film and it changed my life. You all need to see it. Please, watch this movie. Watch it. He's Roland. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Professor? Yes. Could you play Omori, please? Demarin. <laughs> <Second one. laughs> Alright, this movie is called Valis. Okay. They go, uh, Philip K. Dick goes because he's like, well, I'm a science fiction writer. I should probably go see this crap. And um, Horse Lover Fat's like, well, maybe this is God sending me a sign, so I'll go. And then Kevin is just trying not to talk about the movie without spoiling it the entire car ride there, and it's really awkward. They get there. This movie is the plot of this book. It all takes place in like weird artsy visuals and he sits there for pages and describes cut by cut what this film is. But it is the plot of this book. And afterward, yes. Does this film exist? No. Could you make it? No. If it's probably <laughs> described. I, I could. Graphically. I'm not going to. You should. That'd be funny. That would be funny. This is the closest we're going to get to a Dallas movie. Alright, so they see this movie, and all of a sudden, everyone goes, wait, Horse Silver Fat isn't lying. Because everything that happens in this movie is exactly all the crazy shit Horse Silver Fat has been talking about here. So all of a sudden, Philip K. Dick and Kevin take him completely seriously. And they go, okay, well, whoever made this movie clearly knows something they might know about the savior thing. Let's just investigate. So they call up whoever made this movie. It's this universe's version of David Bowie. Oh God. <clears throat> he is called Eric Lampton. So they sent him this message saying... Wait, so how do you know it's David Bowie? Oh, uh, because Phil Kiddick out and out says it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Could yes. you, like, describe how this man talks? <laughs> um... In the audiobook, someone does a horrible David Bowie impression. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like trying way too hard to be like a 60s cool guy, even in the dialogue. It's weird. Could you do a better David Bowie no. impression? <laughs> I'm not doing a David. Do you want to do a David Bowie voice? I can't. Alright. You should. <laughs> so they contact him, and he replies with one word King. Then. Uh, Horse Lover Fat gets another vision from Ballas and says, reply with the word Felix. So he does, and then they get their meeting up, and he goes, okay, meet us in our recording studio in Burbank. So Horse Lover Fat, they convince their Christian friend, um, David to come with them. Horse Lover Fat, Philip Dick, Kevin and David all get in the car and just drive up to Burbank. And then Kevin's like, hey, have you guys watched The Wall yet? <laughs> and he's like, also, uh, my dead cat. They better have an answer about my dead cat. <laughs> So they get there. Turns out, David Bowie's a three-eyed alien. Oh. Oh, that's pretty dope. That's it. Wait, real David Bowie? Or, I mean, is there a real David Bowie in the book, or are you talking about the Eric David Landon. Bowie? Okay. Yes. Has David Bowie, like, like reacted to this at all? No. From what? No. <laughs> Probably for the best. <laughs> so they get there. David Bowie, who I'm just going to call David for the rest of this. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. His yeah. wife and his composer, they are all three-eyed aliens. It turns out what's been going on is that they were the ones who created humanity and created the Earth. Oh. They also <laughs> created time. Oh. They created this because without time and people, the universe is kind of boring. They just made it to be fun. But they always this was always supposed to be a vacation. They were supposed to leave. Side effect of being here is it makes you go insane. Okay. Uh, you just it, existence is inherently a lack of rationality. Which is a Gnostic theory that Philip Kiddick stole from these ancient texts. So, what Valis is, is a computer that their species sent to come over here and rescue them. 
and it sends beams of rationality into your head. So you inherently just can't think logically. What you think is logically is just not off the mark. This thing allows you to think clearly for the first time in your life. Problem is, it uses a lot of um, radioactive material, mm. so you can only be hit with this beam every once in a while, otherwise you're screwed. Most people, it can only be once in a lifetime. Horse Lover Fat is just kind of lucky. Um, Minnie, who is their composer, he got hit by it once, and now he's in a wheelchair and can't move. Oh. He can speak and that's about it. So th this Valus thing is not great. Which, by the way, this is when they finally stop calling it Zebra and just admit that it's Valus. The thing that Philip Kiddick's been talking about his entire life. So, they go, by the way, did you know that the Savior is born and it's our daughter? And they're like, really? Yeah. I would say, oh yeah, we have a two-year-old girl. She's just in the farm hanging out with the animals. Do you want to go talk to God? And they go, yes. So they walk over and this two-year-old just sits up and goes, hey, what's going on? In like perfect English. <laughs> They ask this two-year-old every, like, complicated theological question they can come up with, and she spits back an answer. She has an answer for Kevin's cat. Whoa! It's the answer we've been waiting for. Why did Kevin's cat die? Because the cat was stupid. Because the cat was stupid. Are you serious? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was just so gay. Oh, Kevin throws a fucking fit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, oh, they and the cat. <clears throat> Horse Lover Fat asks, uh, did my friend you killed herself, is she in a better place? And the child replies, no, she killed herself. When you die, you are gone. Don't kill yourself. And then she looks and says, Horse Lover Fat, or she looks at Philip K. Dick and she says, didn't you try to kill yourself? And he was like, no, that was Horse Lover Fat. And then the child looks at Horse Lover Fat, snaps her fingers, Horse Lover Fat is gone. <laughs> what? He's out of existence. Oh my god. <laughs> Turns out... Supposedly he's the main protagonist of the There story. never was a Horse Lover Fat. It's Horse Lover Skinny, more like it. It's the Fight Club twist. Philip Kiddick and Horse Lover Fat have been the How same person the entire time. <gasps> of course. Whoa! Wait, wait what? Are we did it? <laughs> Philip Kiddick is Horse Lover Fat. Why? What? So, like, do we... So you had Horse Lover Fat and Philip Kiddick. Together here, right? Yep. And then Horse Lover Fat is gone, but they were the same person the whole time? So Horse Lover Fat disappears all of a sudden. Um, Philip Kiddick wakes up with himself. No memory of Horse Lover Fat, and everyone's like, oh yeah, he's been a hallucination. You didn't realize? Yeah. So, like, no one saw them in the same room at the same time? This entire thing has been from Horse Lover Fat's perspective. Uh, but he was nice. not, he was a hallucination? Uh, or? Well, here's, here's the weird thing. Horse Lover Fat and Philip K. Dick have been leading separate lives and doing separate things throughout the book. They never explain how both of these things happen, and it's gonna get weirder. Oh. Okay. Okay. Is everyone clear moving forward? Yeah. No, as but go on. As I possibly can be. Next thing, they ask these, uh, they ask the, uh, the two-year-old goddaughter, so what's the deal with these three aliens? And she goes, oh, they're horribly violent, insane creatures that are going to kill you. The only reason they haven't ripped you apart and eaten you already is because I've been stopping them. But I'm starting to feel kind of sleepy, so maybe you should leave before that happens. <clears throat> she also tells them the meaning to life. Oh, shoot. Is, do we learn is this? It, Are we about to learn this? It's, it, it's, it's underwhelming. It, the real meanings are coming later. Never mind. Oh. Go ahead. 42. No, it's... No. Is it regarding um, fish and, and weapons? Oh, I forgot the stupid fish thing. Okay. So, before they even met these people... They were having their own crisis of faith, and God came real quick and gave him a dream with fish and guns. And Horse Lover Fat woke up and said, fish cannot carry guns. And apparently, they go on and say this is the one true word of God that has helped them throughout their journey. They never explain what it means and how it means it. This shirt says fish cannot carry guns, but it got destroyed in my washer at Towson. That, that's, that's that. Yay. So, she tells them, essentially... Follow what the old religions say. Don't be a dick to people. Respect God. Pray. And the time is coming when man needs no gods for themselves. Now go out and preach this evangel. Not yeah. right in my hand. Okay. So they run the fuck out before these three-eyed aliens eat them and kill them. So, while this happens, it turns out Minnie, the guy who had talked to Valis earlier and is now in a wheelchair, he was so desperate to get another beam of rationality 
that he drove a construction truck towards the two-year-old and was like, give me sentience again. And the two-year-old was like, no, and now the two-year-old got ran over and is killed. Ooh. They killed God. <laughs> wait. That's it? I th wait, wait, the two-year-old was not Valus. Valus is the computer, right? The two-year-old is the computer which everyone refers to as God, born incarnate. So the two-year-old is incarnate rationality, and they're worshipping the concept of rationality as God. But what, what, what's the computer? Alien star system, same thing. Okay. Following as good as you're going to get it? Maybe. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. This is not the most important or only Valis lore you're going to hear on that subject, so I'm okay. staying light on it. Okay. So the second uh, God dies, Horse Lover Fat pops back into existence. And he was like, fuck, that sucked. I wanted to ask God more questions. And they were like, well, too bad. So Horse Lover Fat suddenly leaves and goes to Greece, and he's going to keep searching for the Savior. Is he a hallucination? Yes. Okay. So Phil Kadick does not leave and go to Greece. Are you good? Are you still planning to get to the reason why he's called horse lover fat, or is that? Yeah, I'll, I'll get to that. Okay. Uh, did if, if he's a hallucination, is the reason he's back now because uh, Valus has been the two year old has been destroyed? Yes. Okay. So that is why horse lover fat's back, and then <clears throat> he goes and explore, and Philip K. Dick sits there and writes this book, and it ends with him saying, "And this was me keeping my promise to God." I'm writing this book to all of you. So, Horse Lover Fat is an anagram of Philip K. Dick, because Philip means horse in Greek. And uh, <laughs> Dick is lover, and fat is just a dick joke. Horse Lover Fat. <laughs> just a dick joke. Wait, say it again. What does. Isn't Philip usually a goat? In like Greece, Black Philip, or like... Greek, apparently Philip is horse. Okay. And then, and then K doesn't come in at all for this. It's just related to the dick joke. Yep. All right. So, one of the uh, really fun <laughs> things about this yeah. book, the entire time, the big theme of the book is that everything is okay. Everything was okay. Uh, David Bowie keeps pointing out that the time of calamity was in this film. And this film, Ferris F. Fremont, they say they stand in for Nixon. The reason Watergate happened, according to Philip K. Dick, was Vallis. So everything in this was just a coded story of the real story of Nixon. Now that Nixon is gone and the age of trouble is over, we're in the land where everything is okay, which is convoluted as it sounds, it's this really nice message throughout the book. Where like it's just things are gone and people learning to cope with their own difficulties and it's cool. Alright. <clears throat> I'm missing four Mr. Okay. Divine Invasion. This came out a year later. Oh. Yeah. Oh, what about Valis Opera? Or did you not oh, I forgot to mention. There is a opera adapted from Valis. <laughs> <laughs> it actually sounds a lot like some of uh, Dave Malloy's earlier works in the way they just... <clears throat> Ooh. It's a mixed bag, but it's hilarious that this book got turned into a serious opera that what? was performed. What language is it in? English. Where is it performed? Don't remember. All right. But it's on SoundCloud now. <laughs> Divine Invasion. This is probably the wackiest of the books. You thought the three eye aliens were bad. <clears throat> so no, I place... didn't, honestly. I thought the two year old baby speaking perfect English that was the incarnate of rationality and was they bad. They got hit by a truck. <laughs> <laughs> they got hit by a truck. <laughs> by, by, wait, by a guy who couldn't move and was in a wheelchair. It's got in a car, or... drove. I thought Philip K. Dick being <laughs> horse loaded fat. That was pretty crazy. Oh my god, this opera is so long. <laughs> How long is it? It's like, like twenty-two four-minute-long songs. That's oh. a lot of. That's a lot of. That's songs. not that long for an opera. Well, yeah. It's like twenty-two hours. Yeah, also, 22 so hours how long. this is a sequel? <laughs> the events in this book are the symbolic explanation of Nixon, which uh, is movie I've shown here. It's kind of implied that the movie here was based on events. It just there was no Philip K. Dick in this. Yes. How does Valis System A connect to Richard Nixon? Can you connect those dots for me? Ferris F. Fremont is Richard Nixon. His whole um, attacking people in America with the Ram check, that was the um, 
kind of that red skin. Oh, just the president. Yeah. Okay, I'm thinking of the protagonist. My bad. All right. Divine Invasion takes place a hundred years after Ballas. Oh. So, uh, Satan has taken over Earth. Oh, that's not good. <laughs> oh man! This is my favorite TV show, Lucifer. The Catholic Church and the oh, Communist Party have formed to merge one super government, and they rule in proxy in Satan's stead. God has been sent in a spaceship and kicked off Earth. <laughs> they just sent God off to a distant galaxy. Like, hey, bro, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> packed his I, I like that. God is supposed to be this. Like really high power, but so far he's been like, he's, been yeah. he's, he's just he's, he's been he's a, just he's no been stuff. He's been a two year old, and now he's been some type of human that they were able to like put into. No, he or... wasn't a human. It was Satan that did it through the metaphysical forces of darkness. It's not explained. But he was still able to put him in a spaceship and send him off of Earth. <laughs> it's not explained how exactly, but he's and flung forth. out into space and thrown to a distant galaxy. Imagine space. moving God. Exactly. <laughs> what I'm yeah. Imagine telling God, you, God, 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 you God, took you took bitch. God. <laughs> you put him somewhere else! <laughs> okay, so we are now following the story of Herb Asher. He lives in a solitary pod way out in the outer reaches of space. His job is to take signals from Earth and then relay them to other local colonists. Specifically, he's supposed to take the concerts of the superstar called Linda Fox. So all he does his whole day is watch Linda Fox concerts, turn the data, and then go to sleep. And he is religiously obsessed with Linda Fox. He, like, does nothing but want to marry her, look at posters of her all day. That's, like, his religion. He has one neighbor. She lives in a distant pod. It's, like, a two-hour shuttle ride. And she is sick and dying. She is dying from cancer. She'll be dead in about a month. Oh, my God. She's like, can I please come see you? And he's like, you're not Linda Fox. No. So then he starts noticing that he's having some, like, uh, technical difficulties with his equipment. So he calls in one of the local alien repairmen. And the repairman looks at it, uh, touches some dials, and goes, oh, that's probably God. <laughs> he's like, what? He's like, oh, yeah, uh, God lives on this mountain. <laughs> and so he's like, okay, get the fuck out of here, you stupid alien. <clears throat> then... The control panel lights on fire, and a voice talks to him through the fire, and says, Talk to your neighbor with cancer, stop being an asshole. Wait, so it's just the burning bush, but the control panel. And so he says, fuck you, God. And then God starts melting all of his, um... Linda Fox CDs and posters. <laughs> yeah. like, fuck you, God, you're not Linda Fox. <laughs> so he starts frantically putting out, but it's all gone. And he's like, you destroyed it! And God's like, I, I can put it back. Just talk to the cancer woman. He's like, but I don't want to. And so finally he does. And he goes over and she's about to kill herself. Oh my god. And she's like, well, I guess you came over, so now I'm not. And they just sit there and um, they talk and they watch um, this soap opera together. Um, and through this, her realizes, wow, I really have been a dick all these years of this person. I feel really bad about this. And has his, like, big human transformation moments. Meanwhile, they hear a knock outside on their door from space. And they're like, shit, it could be space pirates, they don't know. They open up the door, and it is the star of the soap opera they were watching. And okay. he just walks in. Turns out, the star of the soap opera is also Elijah. Elijah from the Bible. Oh. 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 Okay. He's still here? Yeah, you remember when uh, God, like, beams him up so he would go to heaven and never die? Like, sure, yeah. Heaven? Yeah. Uh, apparently, he just got immortal life. Oh. And now he's running around and just helping God. And he goes to, um, Sherry and is like, so, or not Sherry. <clears throat> Cancer. Wrong, Can't, wrong woman with cancer. <laughs> <laughs> She has a weird sci-fi name. It's like Rhymus in this. R-H-Y-M-Y-S. Yeah. Rhymus. Yeah. Rhymus. Okay. Is some that not fake... a weird sci-fi name? That's a weird sci-fi name. I just want to point out that the only vowel in her name is Y. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Anyway, so Elijah goes, I have good news. 
you're pregnant with God. <laughs> and she's like, what? And he goes, oh yeah, so you know how you're sick? God's been doing that to you. Huh. Because God needs to get back to Earth to fight Satan, and the only way you're going to get through like Earth security and live there is if you have a terminal illness that needs to be treated. So you're going to die, but you're going give to give, give birth to God before that, and the world's going to be saved. And she goes, well, this is a, a shitty deal for me. Yeah. <laughs> Why? And everyone goes, Rivas, calm down. Jeez, you're giving birth to God. Shouldn't you be thankful or something? <laughs> Wasn't she just about to kill herself? Yes. So, okay. <laughs> yeah. P- people are unfairly harsh on Rivas. They, they, they get their comeuppance for that. So, they go to the planet. Um, they give birth to the baby, but Rivas dies in childbirth, so the t- cancer doesn't get her. <laughs> That's her big victory. Herb, who is, like, taking on the Joseph father role, gets hit by a car. In space? On Earth. An Earth car on Earth. car on their way to oh the hospital, God. he gets hit, but... Okay, wait, so, so they, so she delivered God on Earth? On Earth. Okay, we and she needed now. to be pregnant in order to go back to Earth. She needs to or have a terminal have, illness. Uh, okay. Yeah. How far in the future are we? 100 years. So, like, this is just 2082. Yeah. Okay. We'll see. But everything is different. <laughs> Super silent. Yeah. Um, so, her is placed in cryonic suspension until they can find something to bring him back to life. He's out of commission, um, and Ribus is dead. So, Elijah decides to raise baby God. Turns out... Hiding God is not easy. God is constantly walking around as a kid and, like, pointing stuff out and saying stuff. They take him to church one day, and he walks up to the pastor and goes, This communion is not valid. God is not in this uh, wine and bread. And then walks off. (laughs) Now, pissing off the church in the church communist devil dystopia is really bad, and they give him a lot of shit, they end up making it away. Another thing worth pointing out, we'll get back to later. So the head priest is having an affair with his secretary, right? (sighs) And he sits there talking about evil, about how, aha, I'm a priest, but I'm also in a relationship. Look at me being evil. Also, (laughs) there is an alien life form on this planet. So he prays to God. The thing he prays to is a computer. It is a computer built between the church and Communist Party that is supposed to come up with everything, and they've used that to replace God. And the thing starts helping him find the baby. They try to track him down. Shenang and Sue. They never show up again in the All right. So now, God is in daycare. (laughs) He's sick. <laughs> that is one hell of a Dude, I song. forgot where we were, and that just blew me out guard. God is born, I and he pissed off fast. the I realize it's not going to matter yeah. if I'm here or not. I'm going to get another six. You say God goes to daycare, and everybody just leaves. <laughs> Can I get another six? He's like, ooh, goo, God, God. <laughs> this is not, a, this is not a official reunion. Communion. Well, well he, he's six at this point. Oh, so he's just like... Um, Fortnite, this community is looking at it. Yeah, they Sorry. you got hit by the car. Oh. That oh, was God's. Uh oh. That was Herb, the guy we've been following the entire book so far. He was the one who's obsessed with Win the Fox, he got hit by the car. Or were you get a lighter and like a little bottle of rubber alcohol? He was the guy in the space station who wouldn't see Rhymus who had cancer. Herb was the baby? Herb was the father. Who's the baby then? God. God. But God got hit by the car. No, Herb got hit by the car. I thought the baby got hit by the car. Baby, baby is her. Oh baby wait, is her? But like, okay, in in Valis, I think he's talking about the two year old that got hit by a car and was You're like about that baby. Oh, yeah, the one that was God. Oh yeah. So he was dead. This is a new one. This new is born. a new one. <laughs> Who's <laughs> phone? I thought this was about monotheism. <laughs> Uh, it's the that was by the He's fucking... just back, okay. He's just... Oh yeah, he had to be reborn, I forgot. He got fucking red car. <laughs> Remember, he was born in this book. Oh! Yeah. Okay, sure. He, he just died and like came back, it's good. He, he can be born again. Ah. Oh, okay, so it's like Legend of Zelda. Okay. What? <laughs> 
It's like you missed not the reincarnation. It's like Dave from Kipo so and the Wonder Beasts. Oh wow! <laughs> so we are in God daycare. God walks up and this little girl comes up and says, "Hey, you're God, right?" <laughs> And he goes, what? And she goes, oh, it's cool, I'm like you. And she starts bending reality. <laughs> oh, okay! <laughs> Check how hard I can work reality. So Wanda! <laughs> was, I was gonna say Wanda, but okay. Chaos control! <laughs> and God goes, who the fuck are you? <laughs> and she's like, well, you know me, but I'm not gonna tell you yet. Oh, wait, wait. I mean, yeah. Is it safe? No. Okay. Is, do you have your phone on you recording? No, but we should be good. Uh, okay then. But I did need my phone for notes. Well, I'll grab you one. Use my phone. All right. You're so funny. Tyler, do you want to use my phone? No, my phone has the notes on it. Okay. If you find it, you can just throw it at my face. Your phone. Oh, okay. It won't destroy itself or anything, right? Forever, for everybody. Um, no, it doesn't go for you. Specifically, not you. <laughs> <laughs> You're lucky I found it. All right. Woo. <laughs> <where it was. laughs> nice. So, um, God's like, um, wait a second, I recognize you, you're the queen of the fairies. And she goes, yes, but I'm something Fucking deeper. Titanius here now? What did I miss? <clears throat> okay, so, God walks into preschool, and this little girl comes up and she goes, you're God, right? Don't worry, I'm like you. And she starts waving her hand, and reality Oh, and bends. she's, oh, okay, and she's queen of the fairies. Except oh. she's also something deeper. Oh, okay. So we don't know what. Okay. She's also Artemis. A woman. Okay, I'm, I'm something deeper. I, I'm caught up. All right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and then she goes, don't tell Elijah that you know me. Mm -hmm. That's a bad idea. All what right. What daycare is this? <laughs> <laughs> well, none of the guards can see any of this reality bending shit. It's happening and nobody else sees except God and her. Guard, Wait, guards? <laughs> God. 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 The yeah. teachers. The God. Guards. <laughs> you at the public school, it's the same thing. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, daycare. <laughs> <laughs> also, she goes, all right, guys, since we're both, like, big supernatural players here, let me fill you in on what's been going on. So there is a new player in town, and she starts describing who this player is, and basically they're Jesus. So everyone dies, and they have to go to this, like, Egyptian afterlife thing where their sins are weighed against them. No, Everybody Egyptian? Specifically? <clears throat> specifically. Okay. Yeah, About to make the Millennium Puzzle oh, appear. That, that's what happens when you die. You go to the Egyptian, like, the, and the Egyptian and god goes... And like, hey, follow me. Uh, and all of a sudden, this Jesus guy has shown up and is now forgiving people yeah, of their sins, the and they're just going right into heaven. And that's the, the big new thing that's going no on. The front, and nobody people. knows where Jesus came from, where he got his power, all this stuff. Is Jesus is he actually Jesus? Jesus? No. Is he actually Jesus? Well, <laughs> 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 all right. Th th this book starts getting a little crazy. <clears throat> Tyler, that wasn't an answer. Also, I like how you said, "Yeah, this book starts getting a little crazy." Like we haven't heard the other. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> meanwhile, Elijah is teaching God about the Torah. It turns out we've all been reading the Bible wrong. The Bible, once you start really studying and understanding how all the verses link. It's a four-dimensional map. Uh. Oh, wait, is this like Fez? Oh, shoot, this is so cool. So, uh, ancient scholars used to just have to mathematically study the Bible and understand the links and secret symbology of everything. Now you can just plug it into a super-secret hologram program and it puts it all up. And God's looking at this and looking at the shape and goes, No, that's wrong. And Elijah goes, What the fuck do you mean it's wrong? And God's like, see in the beginning here where it says, on the seventh day, God rested? Mistranslated. That's not what I did. I played. <clears throat> now, apparently, if you change this, this changes the entire map. Now, what is this a map of? Uh -huh. Reality. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, like, everything. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so, encoded in the word is, the like, the world. Yes. So it's like if you like to put a JPEG in a text editor, that's what it looks like. That's kind the, of, yeah. That's, so that's what the, okay, that's what the Bible is. So about. everything that ever happens in time, if you correctly project the Bible, you know. And oh. God sees that this projection is wrong. Yes. Is there a direct statement as to which Bible this is? Is it the original Hebrew text? Is it the King James Bible? It is the one copy of the Bible that Elijah has had with him since it was a 
originally written. Okay. The Bible we have now is <laughs> fucked. It's been taken over by the communist uh, Catholic Church. Nothing in it's true. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, what God does is he just meditates on his own and accesses this four-dimensional picture of reality. And he looks at the end of the book and goes, okay, it has a happy ending, everything's good, I don't need to worry about it. This is based off a real PKD experience. PKD is Phil K. Dick, by the way. Yeah. So, remember when Phil K. Dick said he didn't do drugs? <laughs> that was a lie? He was <laughs> He wrote, these are the only books he ever wrote without the help of meth. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so the val which books were it? All, everything on here he wrote without meth, and these are the first books he ever did that with. Okay, so as we all assumed, those really aggressive, like, these are my character standards, but I would never do drugs was a big oh, projection. Yeah. And also, in uh, the exegesis, we learn this Valis incident story. Not quite what it seems. Yeah, oh. figured. So, the light that shines into his head, he did not instantly start receiving messages from God. He already took something that morning, when the pain medication kicked in, <laughs> that's when the pink light hit, and that's when he understood uh -oh, everything. The meth is kicking. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it's, it's pain, it's like the pain, it's like the morphine when he was getting also, his Also, you know how Phil Kinnick only heard from God twice? Wrong. He had these visions every night. For, like, months. And every day he would wake up with new knowledge he didn't have. Yes. So, you're saying uh, kicked in as in he took pain meds that morning, or as in he took drugs and then pain meds? He took drugs and then pain meds. <laughs> <laughs> and the interaction caused this. Yeah. All right, yeah, that, that makes so a lot out, of sense. And so it turns out, and I got to read some of his letters to his friends, and he starts crying and going, this thousand-page document I'm working on, this is all acid flashbacks, isn't it? My life is <laughs> So wait, wait, the whole of the exegesis, this big 2,000-page thing he made, was just a big acid trip he took. Meth trip, I don't know, drug trip. Well, he what can't own. He's having trouble with reality at this point. Because he says maybe it's all a lie, but then he has all these things starting happening to him that he can't explain, and like maybe it's not. He starts panicking. So not even he knows what the fuck's going on in these books. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Now, are you ready to learn how to become God? <laughs> yes! Yes! Yeah! Does it involve taking drugs? <laughs> yes! Yeah! Let's fucking go. All right. You know this four-dimensional picture of literally everything? Yeah. yeah. So, if you can see it, that means you are God inherently, because you see everything, and if you can see it, you can start messing with it. Okay. There's actually a really cool plot in this one, where they argue that Satan technically can become God, because Satan saw all this, and that makes you God. Yeah. Philip K. Dick took acid, saw this, became God. Whoa! <laughs> you can do it too. <laughs> this is how you time travel, Roland. Wait, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, what? This is how you do it. Oh my god! <laughs> okay. So, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing Herb, God's like I fake to say dad. Herb. <laughs> Herb wakes up. They finally get the organ <laughs> And Elijah's like, all right, God, we should probably go visit your dad since he just woke up. God goes, why the fuck would I see that guy? He's an asshole. I know he, how he treated my mom. And Elijah's like, dude, it, it's important to have a relationship with your dad. Just come on, God. Come on. So God meets him, right? And the second herb comes out of cryostasis, a uh, six-year-old God just starts screaming at him. <laughs> And then he's like, all right, I'm just going to fucking smite you. <laughs> Xena, oh, what's that? I was going to bring up, like, you know, the smite command in Minecraft. <laughs> <laughs> Xena, which by the name of that weird girl who had reality betting powers. Yeah. She the, walks the in. The one in the daycare? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Her name is Xena. She just walks in and goes, okay, God, no. Please do not kill your father. Before you do anything rash, let me just show you something. And God's like, what do you mean show me something? I'm everywhere all the time. And she goes, I can show you, I can take you to the one place that you can't see God. And everyone's like, uh, maybe don't do this. <laughs> <laughs> 
And she says, and by the way, God, you're the only one who can come with me. And here's the catch. When you come, you're going to be under my power. Yeah. And God goes, fuck it, why not? Oh, that's smart. So they walk into a portal, and they appear in Berkeley. <laughs> oh! <laughs> <laughs> and here, everything is actually good. Um, Herb and Ribus are alive, and they're happily married. Oh. Is it like Berkeley in, in 2082? Or Berkeley? No, Berkeley in um, 1974. Um, Elijah is just a black guy who works as an auto mechanic and he's happy. Oh, like, nobody is upset in this world. Wait, wait was, was, was Elijah always. No, Elijah was not always black. <laughs> okay. He, he was Middle Eastern, <laughs> and now he's black. Thanks. <laughs> Why? We, we don't know, but Phil can make sure that this is mentioned. Okay. <laughs> Alright. So, now God's like, okay, this is way too good. Something's off here. Are you Satan? And Zena goes, no. In fact, oh, let me show you Satan. So they drive by the zoo, and there is an alien in a cage. No. Uh, <laughs> Satan. And so, essentially... And Satan is in a Ruby California. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So, Zina explains to God, you know, why did you get have to give Ribus terminal illness to take you here? Have you ever considered that maybe... You, you allow a lot of suffering to happen, God, that it maybe doesn't need to happen. See how everyone in my world is happy? And God goes, well, of course everyone in your world is happy. You just made it up like this. This, this isn't real. This is an illusion. And she pulls the whole matrix argument of what's the difference between reality and illusion? And God just goes, can, can you cut the, like, Philip K. Dick shit? <laughs> <laughs> or look, reality is inherently reality. You just, it's intrinsic. You fucking know when something is real. You feel it. Not necessarily. Right? If you're, like, dreaming, you think that's real. Yeah, but, like, if everything is perfect, that's not real. You can't, that you can't tell when you're dreaming. Yeah, that's why you think it would be real. You can't tell that it's not real. Yeah, yeah but the, the thing isn't. that makes it real, like, there's an element of suffering inherent that gives things that grit and feeling of reality, and that's what makes life rewarding. What about nightmares? Well, dreams and nightmares all have that same, like, you are never in this perfect happy state. There's literally no problems here. There is no unhappiness. Okay. <clears throat> and so... All of a sudden, God's like, people actually prefer a little bit of misery in their life. Because that's what makes things worthwhile. Okay. <laughs> and then you're fucking stupid. Says, let's make a bet. You know this Herb guy? You Remember how he really wanted to fuck Linda Fox? Let's tempt him to cheat on his wife with two versions of Linda Fox. The perfect one and the flawed one. And let's see which version of Linda Fox he goes for. Fuck Rivas. Just the assumption that he's going to leave his current wife to go with one of these two women they're creating to tempt him. That's a given. So, big surprise. God, or Herb, in this fake reality, actually prefer prefers the version of Linda Fox that God made, who's slightly imperfect. Thus, he proves his moral. All of a sudden, Xena and God are happy, and Xena decides to announce who she really is. Two twists here. First, she's the Holy Spirit. What? How? When God was kicked off Earth, he was severed and ripped apart from the Holy Spirit. Remember when Zina said, I'm like you? Trinity. That's how they're like each other. Oh, my God. Ne yes. So, so like, they're just part of that Trinity, right? So yeah. God is the Father in this case, right? Yeah. Okay, so we're this still looking for the Son. This is very confusing because the God that was born is not Jesus. It's God the Father. Jesus is somewhere else. And he's older than God right now. Yes. Cool. Also, the Holy Spirit has another twist. Not only are they the Holy Spirit, but they are literally the Torah. What? what? How could... How? They are the law that is written and when projected creates the 4D map. Because that is the creation of God and the creation of God is sentient. And God knows everything that's within that creation, but the thoughts of creation itself are outside of it. So that is how Zina was able to take God somewhere he didn't know. Because this is Zina's literal imagination, which just creates an alternate reality, and God goes there, and because the reality is not in Zina, it is the thought of Zina, he didn't know. Bro, what I, are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> he, he, like, knows what he's saying, too. <laughs> no, he doesn't! Yes, Wait, who do you think no, knows I, what no. they're saying? 
You're saying it doesn't it doesn't feel like he knows what he's talking about right now. What Tyler? I know Tyler knows no, what he's, he's talking so about. Sure of himself, yeah. and that's what's fucking scary. Yeah, Tyler knows what he's saying. I think Philip K. Dick doesn't know any of this. <laughs> Tyler knows more about the books than the author does. <laughs> <laughs> that actually might be true. Yeah. Oh, God. Oh, okay. <sighs> so now that God is finally reunited with His creation. And himself, because it's the Holy Spirit. They, like, have a fucking party in this, like, perfect world. They run around, and they free all of the animals in the zoo, and then they leave. Okay. Satan was in the zoo. Oh. They left. They are no longer in the story. Wait, there I thought... no more God, no more Holy Spirit. Yes. I, th I thought that was a separate reality. Yes. So, like, who cares? Well, we spend the rest of the book in the separate reality. Oh, no! <laughs> There's more to this book? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, throughout all of this time, there has been a... Yeah. Are we supposed to like these characters? Because I really can't tell. I'm trying I'm trying to figure that out. <laughs> so, because, because I'm like, oh, all right, God and Zena, and oh, and then they just freed Satan and, like, unleashed By him. By accident. They well, didn't I, mean to. But, but Zena literally shows God who Satan is. They know who he is. They, they, they caught up. You know, they, they, they run around, free the zoo, and then Satan just walked out. Okay. <laughs> Throughout all of this time, there's been this really stupid side plot I skipped over where Herb is trying to win Linda Fox's or affection. I get, I can. <clears throat> and he's finally on a plane to go over and help her record and leave his wife, who was happily married to before God came and fucked up everything here. Thanks, God. <clears throat> so, he's in the car driving. When a goat walks up to him, opens the door, sits in, and goes, Hi, I'm Satan, you're fucked. Ooh. Oh. Ooh. I'm taking over this world now that God left and clearly doesn't care about any of you. And we get to find out what Satan's superpower is. Satan can take the beautiful things God made and make you see them as bad. Okay. Which actually is kind of cool, because the whole thing is he twists your morality where you see things as ugly and bad when there is no problems, and your attempts to solve these problems are the evil you cause. <clears throat> so, Satan's big evil plan to ruin her master is he's going to take him to Linda Fox, and then he's going to make Linda Fox look ugly. Oh no! I... no, okay. And so he's freaking out because you're getting closer and closer to your house. And if Satan gets to her, she'll look ugly and he'll never have this hot woman in his life again. So, they get right to the door. And then Linda Fox walks out with a gun, shoots Satan in the head, and is dead. No more Satan. Because Linda Fox is Jesus. What? Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. I, I, I was I was caught up in non lost again. <laughs> Let okay. me explain. The Trinity is here. We're all fucked. So, when the fox was created to be this perfect image put in this like non-perfect body, right? It was a dose of reality to the like supernatural image of truth. Just like like Jesus was born in a physical flawed human body, but contains the essence of the divine. All of time happens at once, right? In this. So, by creating Linda Fox here, this is when the entity of Jesus was actually created, even though Jesus was born thousands of years earlier. Okay. Now, how, does the, how do they get out of this alternate universe and back to the main timeline? We don't know. This is where the book ends. Oh. Oh, cool. The Divine Invasion, everyone. Drugs, 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 1982, Philip K. Dick dies. Oh. Oh, wait, are you serious? Wait, like in real life? Or? Yeah, real oh. life. Like, no more real life? life? He's oh. gone. <laughs> the way that so much shit has happened that that question makes I don't know what the hell's happened. <laughs> <laughs> yes, de so dead in real life. Dead in real life. Okay, that sucks. And Not that's where more valid books. <laughs> may, may, might I point out that 1982 is also where things get interesting. Yeah, Philip K. Dick is finally out of the picture. <laughs> now we can get to the good stuff. Can't believe Philip K. Dick okay. is finally. So, right here, 1982, oh, yeah. two very important things happen. Philip K. Dick dies. Yeah. Yep. None of his stuff goes to his wife, Tessa Dick. 
This is his <laughs> sixth huh? wife. Tessa dude. <laughs> Tessa dude. She gets nothing. She gets All nothing. All of his money and his rights go to this le weird legal entity called the PKD Estates. Okay. It is a Pretty mix cool of some sort of like corporate entity they formed that's partially owned by a few of his different kids. It's very muddy. Okay. The same year, the movie Blade Runner comes out. Okay. Ooh. Blade Runner does not do well financially, but everybody sees it. Yeah. All of a sudden, people are obsessed with Phil Kiddick adaptations. Remember when I said he was a minor celebrity that like only few people heard about? Yeah. Phil Kiddick, out of nowhere, becomes a household name. Like right after is, he dies. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, he never got to see, he only got to see the first 15 minutes of Blade Runner without Vangelis' soundtrack. And he was like, wow, I'm really glad. I hope this movie ends up being okay. Dies, movie comes out. Like, and it's pretty good, actually. And it explodes! Blade Runner, one of the best movies ever made. <clears throat> Alright, so. I wouldn't recommend it. Right up there with the Care Bears. He, wouldn't, he doesn't really recommend any movies. <laughs> well, when I recommend a movie to you, it's going to be a movie you like. So I'm very careful about how, what I. Hey Tyler, play Omori. The Barrett. <laughs> Holy fuck! It's third. That's three. You went an hour and forty five minutes. Yeah. Let's go, Roland. <laughs> All right. So. Bap, 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 bap. Valis is weird. All right. Yeah, really? we noticed. <laughs> really? Holy the PKD fuck. estate is like shit. Everyone kind of likes Phil Kick. He's core now. He has this weird, like, what is reality aesthetic. But if people realize how fucked up this guy is, he's not going to be a cash cow anymore. So they just keep Valis on the down low. They try to sell none of it. They don't admit that it exists. Well, Valis blows up anyways, because... Phil K. Dick fans get really excited, and people are like, where's the third book? Because Phil K. Dick was working on two more sequels. One is called The Transmigrations of Timothy Archer, and the other is called Owl and Daylight. He has unfinished manuscripts for both of them. <clears throat> Eventually, in 1982, oh, yeah, later that year, Valis says, fine, we'll publish, or the PKD says, fine, we'll publish the last Valis book. And it comes out, and the style does not quite read like Philip K. Dick. Mm -hmm. And the ending is particularly suspect. And so everyone starts saying that, like, they intentionally are trying to make it more palpable. And his wife, like, Tessa Dick, gets very upset about this. <clears throat> so as we're going through, just pay attention to what seems off. Mm -hmm. All right. So, Transmigrations of Timothy Archer. We begin with this woman named Angel. It is uh, the 1960s in Berkeley, California. <coughs> <coughs> Angel is married to Jeff. Jeff is the son of Timothy Archer. Timothy Archer is a bishop. And he is a very outspoken, very extroverted, everybody likes Timothy Archer. He's cool. Angel's best friend, Kirsten, is a big political activist. And she's trying to get herself, like, established on the ground running. And Timothy has been looking for, like, an activist to work with. And so Angel decides to take everyone to dinner and just get them acquainted. This is how the book opens. Turns out, Jeff and Angel's marriage is very rocky. And Who Jeff... Who would have known? <laughs> Who would have known? Jeff really wants to bang Kirsten. Oh. Wait, so what is their relation again? Jeff and Angel are married. Okay. Kirsten is Angel's best friend. Okay. Oh. <laughs> so, they go to dinner, and Kirsten and Timothy, Timothy is the bishop, Kirsten is the activist, start screaming at each other about abortion. It starts as a polite dinner conversation, and then they're just yelling across the table. And it turns out they both really needed that, because that night, Timothy and Kirsten hook up. Woo! Alright. Alright, I'm already seeing notice Come I'm on. already noticing a problem already. This is too mundane. <laughs> yeah, this is yeah. Just, yeah, right. This is like, just relationship just stuff. Just abortion? This, this has nothing to do Va with Valis, the romance arc. Seven guys being moved <laughs> yeah. to Burbank yeah. and killing each other. The, the fucking romance arc. So 
Kirsten becomes Timothy's, like, secretary, right? <laughs> and it's like an unofficial thing, but everyone knows they're fucking, and this is really messing with Jeff. <laughs> because Jeff is like, I want to be with Kirsten, and now my dad's fucking here, that's weird. No. So, Kirsten and Timothy <clears throat> take a vacation to England, because this world's equivalent of the Dead Sea Scrolls was just discovered. Now, reading through the Dead Sea Scrolls, Timothy learns a few things about the history of, like, Jesus and what he did. It turns out, and Jesus states this pretty directly, I am not God. I am delivering these mushrooms that are God. You take a bite of these mushrooms, they give you the experience, and you connect with God and become one with heaven. Jesus was a drug dealer, yes. Something's wrong too open about drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, things are definitely off here. Uh, points. Golden star. Golden star. Yo! <laughs> do I lose one of my demerits? No. You uh, <laughs> All right. Golden star. <laughs> all right. So, this really, really shakes Timothy's faith. Because the big thing with Timothy is that he's this major intellectual, and he's like, I'm not like other bishops. I actually <laughs> <laughs> make a cohesive argument like and believe girls. in God because of the facts. I have, like, no faith. That's not my thing. So he reads the Dead Sea Scrolls, gets conclusive proof that the only way to really believe what the Catholics are saying is to disregard all proof and just have faith. And he's, like, not into that. Well, anyways, while him and Kirsten are off, like, reading manuscripts and fucking in England, Jeff decides, I can't take this anymore, and kills himself. Oh, oh. it's getting spicy. Like, Jeff is Jesus. That's, that's pretty, that's pretty on par. And Jeff makes a, it, it very so clearly much. implies Jeff's like, this is because of you, dad, fuck you. There's oh. so much suicide in these books. Well, that I'm happens really been a lot of Phil Kadex friends. A lot of suicide, really? Yes. <laughs> So, Timothy is like, alright. Then he starts seeing his son's ghost in his house. And Kirsten sees it too. And the two of them become convinced that Jeff is trying to contact them from beyond the grave. So they go consult a medium and try to speak to Jeff. The Catholic Church really doesn't like this. <clears throat> so they kick... Timothy out of the organization, he's no longer a bishop. <laughs> Before we get to what the medium says, we also need to talk about Bill. Bill is Kirsten's son from another marriage. <clears throat> and Bill is not mentally altogether. It's never specified what kind of mental illness he has, but he cannot just yeah. the board's told me. <laughs> okay. I thought you were just gonna push the whole thing off. I would have, I would have cried. But he's like a really nice kid. He's trying really hard. He just can't hold down a job or do anything. And so he's just kind of hanging out. And um, Timothy has been Bill's spiritual mentor throughout this because Bill is trying to come to faith. So Bill comes to Timothy and is like, "Hey, so I feel like this whole seeing medium thing isn't very Christian." And Timothy's like, there's no reason to have faith. God's a lie. Uh, just, just wallow around in misery. Yeah. Bill, Bill doesn't take this well. So they go to the medium. And the medium says, all right, Jeff forgives you, Timothy, but fuck you, Kirsten. You're a woman in a Philip book. Oh, fucking. no. Also, the medium says, Kirsten, you are going to die soon because of this. And it's going to be a painful and horrible death. Does she have cancer? No. Oh, wait, oh, yes, she does. <laughs> <laughs> All right, checks out. Philip K. Bit dick book. Yeah, I'm like, I'm like picking out the bits that he clearly wrote. Timothy. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll get to my personal theory and what happened with this book. So, um, and she said, Timothy, you're going to die the same death Probably. In fact, your death is probably going to be way more horrible than Kirsten's. You've got a little bit longer to live, but it's going to suck. There is one way out of this. If you become a, like, a, a good Christian and listen to God, God will give you a way out. Apart from that, you're fucked. And then the medium just oh, says, okay, have a good day. Walk off. So, <clears throat> Kirsten doesn't take this well. She's really upset, and it turns out her relationship with Timothy is horrible. So, Timothy constantly makes her feel guilty for sleeping with him. 
Because he's a priest and she's like ruining him, except not because he wants this. <clears throat> Kirsten, um, so she just smoked pot, right? And Timothy constantly like was like, you shouldn't do drugs, you're a horrible person. And then she slowly slipped into harder and harder things. And then Kirsten was like, had a problem and Timothy wouldn't get her help because that could fuck up his reputation. Kirsten is painted as the bad guy in this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could figure that one She's out. A woman, uh, and a, yeah. Philip K. Dick novel. Yeah. But yeah, so it, that's really shitty. A horse and lover fat novel. Kirsten <laughs> starts screaming at Angel, being like, Angel, you've been fucking Timothy behind my back, haven't you? Because she has cancer. When you get a cancer in a Philip K. Dick novel, that just starts making you angry at everyone around you. Probably because there was one person who did that to him, probably one of his wives, and he never got over it. So... Are we going to go into the psychology of all this? Yeah, way down here. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Kirsten just gets angry at everyone and everyone, and Angel is sticking with her and trying to help her through this, right? Angel's like, okay, um, you should really leave Timothy, because clearly this is a bad relationship, and things are going poorly. And then Kirsten goes, you're just trying to steal Timothy from me, aren't you? And then she kills herself. Oh my god. Okay. Angel does not take this well, and neither does Timothy. Do we still have a red marker? Can we start Xing out names? <laughs> what is with uh, you and Xing out names? I just think it's funny. Can, yeah. can do you want me involved in this or not? I do <laughs> want you involved in this. Roll a demerit. Uh, <laughs> you can get the demerit off if you get me a marker. Where are the markers? I don't know. Back there somewhere. <laughs> uh, it also helps me oh, visualize who's alive and who's dead. Kirsten. Boop, boop, boop. Jeff. <laughs> okay. Okay. Roland can't find a marker, therefore he keeps his demerit. <laughs> yeah, can it? <laughs> so, a few months pass. Angel handles this by going, you know what? This whole group of people is really toxic and bad stuff happened. I'm just going to leave and live my own life. She ends up with a new boyfriend, gets a job at a record store, goes back to school. She's relatively happy, right? Here's the problem. She's in Berkeley. Berkeley. <laughs> Bad. All right. Timothy goes in the complete opposite direction. He's like, well, there's no people in my life anymore, so I'm going to devote myself fully to studying my religious ex eccentricities. So he just sits there for hours and studies the Dead Sea Scrolls. He discovers something in his research. He finds the Jesus mushroom. Wait, oh. what? The mushroom that Jesus was selling the that lets you become God. <laughs> We did we mention this before? Yes. Oh yeah. wow, okay. I missed a very important step here. <laughs> you you know how um drugs make you god? Yeah, I know Canon, that. And Dead Sea Scrolls, Jesus is a drug dealer. Timothy finds where the mushroom is growing. Okay. It's somewhere deep in the desert, in the Holy Land, nobody knows but him. And he's like, I need to talk to Jeff again and talk to Kirsten again. I need to like make up for my mistakes. He's a kind of been a shitty person. So I need God's divine wisdom to help me make up for this stuff. So he goes to Angel and is like, look, I'm pretty sure when the medium said there's one hope for me, this is it. And I need you to come with me. Because if you don't come, we are both going to die. Cheers, what do you mean? He's like, you live in Berkeley. You, you can't be happy. Your life is inherently meaningless. You are forever a student here. You will never go out into the world and do anything meaningful. And by the way, I bet your relationship with your boyfriend sucks, doesn't it? Turns out it does. She, she's unhappy. So Timothy's like, leave with me, go to the Middle East, it'll be cool. And she's like, well, I don't want to be your secretary like Kirsten. That, that's weird. And like, is, uh, no sexual tension between us. And Timothy's like, no, no, of course not. But maybe. <laughs> but no. And so she goes, no, I'm not doing this. Right? Demonized for it. Morally bad choice. So, Timothy goes to the Middle East by himself to find the mushroom. He gets in a car, brings nothing but two things of soda, drives out into the desert, dies of dehydration before he finds the mushroom. Yeah. Timothy Archer, dead. Yeah. And it's Angel's fault. Angel is fucked up over this. If she was fucked up before, because apparently she loved Timothy. Oh no! Uh, so now she goes to seek the help of a medium. Timothy's old, not medium, this is a spiritual guru. Timothy's old best friend called Edgar Barefoot. Edgar Barefoot is Alan Watts. 
If any of you know who that is. Nope. No. Nope. Alright, never mind then. So, Edgar Erfurt is kind of like this white guy who lived in uh, China for a while, really, really got into Tibetan Buddhism, just kind of spreading around California. She goes, talks about life shit, and he just gives her like the basic textbook answers. And she's like, well, this sucks. But I'm doing nothing else that feels productive in my life, so I might as well keep going here. Eventually, she runs into Bill. And they're like, wow, it's cool to see you again. You're the only person from this entire group who isn't dead, not horribly fucked up. And then Edgar's like, oh, you met Bill. Bill's the Buddha. Like, you actual, actual Buddha. Yeah. Okay, so there's a date. <clears throat> so it turns out, the reason he says this is because Bill has been awakened because when Timothy died, his spirit entered him. Yes. His spirit, with the mushroom knowledge, and now Bill is awakened. Yes. Was Timothy Buddha, or was it just a Bill, and Bill is Buddha, but also has Timothy's... Don't worry about this. Okay. <laughs> so, Angel goes, what the fuck is wrong with you, Edgar? This is a clearly mentally challenged person. Please stop telling him he's Buddha. This is hurting him. And Edgar's like, well, here's the thing about Buddha, right? It's not literal. All of this is symbolic. So if I'm telling him the symbolism and angels, like, shut the fuck up. I'm tired of this intellectual, spiritual bullshit that I've been living in this entire book. In fact, you know what? Fuck Dallas. Fuck everything that has to do with God. What? Religion. I'm just gonna go be a good person and not touch intellectualism ever again. Hey, where'd that come from? Huh, that's strange. I'm just gonna go read fun sci-fi stories and smoke weed. So she goes off and two of them smoke weed together. Then, um, this whole time, Bill finally starts realizing that, okay, maybe I'm not the Buddha, and I really need help. Please help me. And Angel's like, uh, I, I kind of don't like people right now. I, I need space. So, Edgar is like, look, Bill needs help. You have money, you have a place, can you please help him? And this ends with Angel going over to Edgar and saying, all right, I'll help Bill in exchange for this valuable record you have. He happens to have the special recording of some Japanese artist who would record four sounds and then play music over them. That's like the music. She got the record, and then she's like, ha ha, I was going to do it for free anyway, so now I can sell this record for $10. Look at me, I'm smart. Book ends. Okay. So, what all seems off about this? Uh, I could Love follow that. I feel like there's definitely an alternate ending where something horrible happens to Angel. Yeah, it was too easy to follow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I have a lot of people start thinking that this was originally a Philip K. Dick book yeah. that started getting modified so it was watered down, felt less weird, and could be accessible. People got upset over this. And then they started noticing that Messing with Philip Kiddick books is kind of a bad idea, especially since all the way back here, he literally wrote a book about how the world is fucked, the truth is out there somewhere, but it's not going to be my books. My books from here on out are going to be fake, and they're going to slowly lead you to be more and more Christian. This book is all about Gnostic and kind of like Eastern philosophy finding God. This book is literally just Christian mythology, and this book leaves all of the supernatural elements out, and they're just in the church. Also, in all of these books, they talk about how they're in the era of peace, right? Even though, like, conflict's happening in the book, the Great Calamity is over, you don't need to be worried. That is not at all the ethos of Alice in May. Remember, this book was like a fascist dystopia where we needed to be paranoid? So then people start pointing out, wait, what if the entire Ballast trilogy has been forged? What? <clears throat> Let's make things even worse. In 2009, Tessa Dick says, I'm going to like finally bring up the manuscript for the real Ballast sequel, and she publishes it. PKD Estate immediately sues her out of existence. Which makes sense, right? But then they start going to everyone who has a copy of this book, trying to take it and getting rid of it. They start suing libraries, burning every copy. So I talked to Dustin, there's four left. Now I'd be wondering where this four number comes from. I just got it from her, she googled how many were available for sale online, and that's for four. So there's probably a few more copies in private collections, but this book is pretty much completely inaccessible. So because the PKD estate tried so hard to erase the end of the Ballast trilogy, when everyone's kind of suspecting that this entire thing might be a cover-up, and Philip K. fans are big conspiracy theory nuts, 
this really doesn't look good. Now, we're going to go full-on conspiracy theory mode. Let's go. Remember when he talked about how like, the song came out in a different artist? Well, he believed, Phil could believe that Bishop James Pike was in him, right? He became this person. This entire book right here is a true story. Owl in Daylight? Uh, Transmigration of Timothy Archer. Oh, okay. All of these people are real. The people who kill themselves really kill themselves. Oh. This bishop really fell from grace for these exact reasons. So, and this, oh, I completely forgot the book Here, Time, or Death. Okay, so, the last thing Kirsten does before she kills herself is Ghost writes the book for Bishop Timothy Archer that is just an entire book explaining all of their bullshit pseudoscience around uh, Jeff coming back to life, and this is the book that really kicks him out of the church. This book is real. It's called The Other Side. It was published in 1968. So I decided to read this. See, this kind of sounds like the secret message of truth that Philip K. Dick might have been talking about. Didn't get anything Dallas related. But the story is so much sadder when you know all of this is true. This is not a book for the faint of heart. Wait, wait, so it's confirmed that this tra the transmigration of Timothy Archer is based on real events? Yes. Okay. If I read this, it's an exact mirror. Wait, so is the other side um, exact mirror of transmigration of Timothy Archer? Other side is what this book was within this book, and it tells the story of everything going on here, and this was all true. Okay. <laughs> Alright. Now, we are finally going to hear Owl in Daylight, the real conclusion to how this trilogy was supposed to go. Or in Tessa Day. You're going to get, get a lot of clout for this one, Tyler. Also, this is the first Dallas book written by a woman. What? So we are finally going to get real, sympathetic female characters. Oh, big thing I should mention. Tessa Dick will not appear on Google if you look up Philip Kick's wives anymore. After she publishes this book, PKD say takes her out. So you cannot find her. You can only stumble across her. The only reason I knew she existed was because I read Philip Kiddick's diaries, yes, Jesus. <laughs> All right, <laughs> Owl in Daylight is horribly written. Tessa Dick's a wonderful woman, but she writes like a middle schooler. Oh, it's hilarious. So Phil Kiddick, the big writing style of his stories, the reason they're so fun to read, is his characters constantly go on these conversations about life, and everyone has these fun viewpoints, and they have very serious, like, academic things that back up their books. Yeah. So did his wife take the manuscripts that he was doing and then wrote her own? She took in manuscripts songs. and then, like, finished it with what she thought he was supposed to put in it. Okay. But it's very clear that he had an idea manuscript and she wrote the words. Okay. <clears throat> and some of it's completely <laughs> com ununderstandable. <laughs> okay. It opens. There is something called Archons. There are good Archons and there are bad Archons. The good Archon, uh, the bad Archons have trapped Earth in a black box. Here we are tortured. This is a surreal prison. Who, why are we here? <laughs> this is already feeling much, much more heavy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the good Archons want to help, but they can't because they are barred by the one. We never know what that means. So, the good Archons send a secret message encoded with how to escape the prison for humanity. But they don't send it to humanity. They send it to a random other alien species called the slugs. Uh -huh. The slugs don't know that they have this. <laughs> All right, moving on. This is the story of Arthur Bimmer. He is a B-movie music composer. Um, he makes a lot of money making like these horror movie themes, but he gets no respect, and he's very miserable. He has a high society wife who constantly looks down on him and he hates her. And he has a daughter that he says was probably his lover in a past life and he's obsessed with her. Mm. Mm. Yeah, sounds like him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he writes paragraphs about her angelic features. When she was a kid, she gave him an I Love My Dad mug and he carries it around everywhere. And when people make fun of it, he yells at them. Um, yeah. 
So he's walking out one day and he gets hit on the back of the head. He wakes up in a hospital and his wife's like, fuck you, I hate you because I'm a woman in the Phil Kinnick novel. Mm -hmm. That was a lie. There are no good female characters. In fact, it gets worse. What? <clears throat> so the entire time she's like the epitome of evil and selfishness and richness. And he's sad. We finally get a... The second chapter opens from her perspective, and she says the only reason I don't like him is because he's upset at me, and this is this infinite upset cycle. But then it goes right back and says, oh no, I was wrong, she's just a bitch. So, now that um, Arthur um, has been knocked out, all of a sudden he noticed that he can't compose uh, B-movie scores anymore. It just like hurts him to do it. Then, he starts getting pink light visions. Uh, yeah, uh, there he is. <laughs> and you start getting mathematical formulas appearing in front of his head. He doesn't like math. He has a phobia <laughs> of <the> in <laughs> middle school. He's like, numbers smash! And so he freaks out, passes out. He wakes up, and now instead of seeing numbers, he's hearing notes. And he's like, oh shit, music, I like music. Yeah, so that's... he just starts copying these notes down and playing it. Turns out these are brilliant symphonies. Now while this is going on, his health is degrading, and he's like, shit, well the tumor is probably giving me the super artistic ability. So he's scared of the tumor being removed. While all of this is going on, he's now in a wheelchair, he can't walk around. And they open up a theme park based on the horror movies that he worked on. <laughs> 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 Are you okay, Tyler? So, this is taking place in the 1990s, right? Okay. This is a virtual reality theme park where you walk into the door and they just project the world around you and you're completely lost in the simulation. By the way, when we go to the event, the daughter and the wife come with Arthur and there's a whole paragraph explaining why the wife is wearing fancy clothes and that makes her a bitch. She wants attention drawn on herself. And the daughter's wearing plain clothes because she doesn't care about fame. She only loves her dad. So, he, Arthur, suddenly... Going back. So, it turns out he doesn't have a brain tumor. The slugs put in a device in the back of his head. This is phrased out of nowhere. There is just a page break and then you start talking about slugs and you have to piece this together. Yep. Uh... <laughs> also, it turns out these slugs throw temper tantrums whenever they don't know something. So they're like, you know what? I wonder what's inside this um, amusement park. So they start kind of trying to push Arthur into going to it. Also, these slugs are here for some random reason. They just want to make people better. They're trying to establish contact with Earth. So they put this thing in Arthur's head and they try to talk to him through the universal language of mathematics. But humans are so stupid, according to these slugs, they don't understand math. By the way, slugs spend pages talking about how stupid humans are, and I hate them. So, instead they're teaching him music, we don't know why they're trying to make him a better person, it has something to do with first contact and something to do with the Archons. Duh. So, now the slugs don't care about anything, they just want to know what's inside this music park. So Arthur walks in, and all of a sudden the park's computer chip takes over the computer chip they put in the back of his head, and the slugs go, wait, Instead of wrestling control back, this could be interesting. So they hack the park's computer chip and take control of that, and now they have control of the interior space of Arthur's mind and his inner... A mix of some random female voice that nobody knows where it comes from, the influence of the slugs, the influence of the pre-programmed exhibits in the parks, and the deepest subconscious memories of Arthur all combined to put him in this weird virtual reality that slugs control. How does any of this work? It's a sci-fi sci novel by Philip K. Dick. Please stop asking questions. You're the professor. Demerit. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, Four. question. Five. Five? Play Omori. <laughs> all of that's live. <laughs> all right. So, these exhibits are exhibits of hell. So first thing, he just wakes up and he's burning in hell. Um, and the aliens are like, okay, maybe not this. 
They, the alien slugs yeah. switch over, and now Arthur wakes up, he is 18, and he has a completely new name. He wakes up at 18, he has no memory of who he is, and he's starting to just get adjusted to this new life. This new life is kind of supposed to be where he was when he was 18, except random details are changed for no reason, and the slugs have added in a new element. Karma is real. So whenever he does good things, good things happen back to him. Alright? Alright. First thing he does is he goes to work at this record store, meets this girl named Candy, uh, and they start dating, right? <laughs> then, um, this new Arthur starts hanging out with a bunch of artsy kids, and everyone's scared because he might catch the gay. <laughs> this is a major concern of his. He's like, I've been questioning Two. my sexuality because I've been hanging around gay arts kids, and this is dangerous to my health. Candy and my mother constantly point this out. There's this big moment where he wants to go to the bar with his friends, but it's a gay bar and he can't go in without Candy to come with him. And Candy doesn't like his gay friends, so he has to not go to the bar and drink with his friends, and it's really sad. Poor homophobe. Alright. So eventually he decides, fuck my mom, I'm just gonna leave and move in with these artsy kids. Well, these artsy kids start giving him these weird leftist ideas, like maybe the Korean War is bad. <laughs> <laughs> and Candy's like, well, I only like military men. Actually, why aren't you in the military? Is it because you're gay? And you're <laughs> in the military? And he's like, no, it's because I have an injury on my foot. And so she's like, okay. I'll date you for now, because I kind of believe you, but you need to improve yourself, because I'm dating a soldier when they get back. So, <clears throat> turns out Candy is the same thing as the younger version of his ex-wife in the future. And in Whoa, real life, yes. where did that come from? So not in the future, in the real world, his ex-wife is named Egna, but in this she's named Candy, because he's in this virtual reality simulation of when he was 19. Oh wait, he's still in the simulation. Yeah. Oh. And the sim and so okay, we're several layers deep. Yes. I am losing myself here. <laughs> and the book does not differentiate between them. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, we're in this virtual world, and the yeah. alien slugs are throwing a fit. He's like, all this guy does is sit around and bitch about how much he hates his wife and wants to fuck his daughter. And now that he can boomer go life again. He's marrying the same woman again. What is wrong with him? Boomer. So the entire world starts having signs go up say, you're on the wrong path, turn back now. Homeless men are holding up signs saying, dump the woman you're with. And he's just walking by ignoring them. So the alien slugs say, we're really not getting this guy. So let's just change the simulation and send him to hell. Oh. So they change simulation, he spends some time in hell, scares him straight, he finally decides not to date Candy. Two pages later, he changes his mind they're dating again. <laughs> but Candy decides to start dating other men. And then Arthur has to have a talk with her and goes, you know what, I'm not okay with you dating other people and fucking them while we're dating, so maybe we should break up. And she goes, fine, whatever. But they still keep going dancing on Saturdays. So, also, Arthur finally starts writing music. The slugs are like music is shit. No value in no, music. Boo. Music is not math, therefore waste of time. We were teaching music to help you get closer to math, so we don't want you wasting your time with music again. So slugs just alter reality. Every time he tries to go to his job at the record store, he just ends up at a bookstore now. And he's like, well this is weird, but uh, fuck it, I'll, I'll go with this. I work at a bookstore now. So his boss says, all right, start putting away books. So he walks around the store and just does it. And he finds Plato's dialogue in the children's section. So he picks it up, moves it over to the philosophy section, accidentally drops the book. The book disappears, turns into Plato. Oh, yeah, you know, like it does. Now, Plato is like a giggling madman. He's just screaming, hee hee hee, jumping around. And then he tries to explain the. Recording. He wakes up at 8 times. All right, all right, we gotta continue this. Okay, so he also he notices that the soulmate person in the bookstore is a lot like his daughter. I fucking do it. <laughs> oh. Oh. And so then all of a sudden the slugs are like, okay, time to make this surreal. So he wakes up, 
And um, he and his friend Bobby, who's one of the arts friends who ended up getting drafted in the Korean War, lost his legs. Bobby walks back, has both of his legs, and he's told that you are now going to take 12 trials. If you pass these 12 trials, you can get the woman you were always meant to belong with. So they go through, and Bobby sent to guide Arthur on this quest so he can finally be with the woman that's like his daughter. Turns out, the woman isn't for Arthur, because Arthur's already married and she's his daughter. It's for Bobby. And he's like, fuck, I'm not going to help my friend marry my daughter slash moon of my dreams. They fight, they get over it. Every trial in this fucking game is like naked women dancing in front of them, they just have to resist the urge to touch or speak to them. <laughs> And Arthur fails every time. Oh my! <laughs> Bobby Listen. succeeds. So halfway through the trials, like whatever surreal entity is running this, not verified, clarified, comes to Arthur and says, "Look, you're bad at this. Just stop. We're gonna let Bobby keep going, taking these trials. You just go back home to your wife." Arthur's too down bad. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, down bad. <laughs> Down he goes his wife, and then the two of them are turned into owls. Uh, oh. Are they in daylight? In daylight. And uh, they can't see in daylight. Oh. Be because they're owls. Is that a thing owls can't do? Yep. Owls can see. Not in daylight. It's not very well. Yeah, not very well. Okay. We can see better at night than they can in day. Okie dokie. According to Tessa Dick. Okay. So, now they are brought into the animal kingdom, where they just live as birds. Turns out, while um, Arthur is in the hospital, his wife Edna is having the same dreams of being an owl, and for the first time, they're actually happy together as a couple. And so, Arthur keeps commenting, well, I'm really happy with my wife, and I guess I could stay here, but I'm going to have to live the rest of my life knowing that I'm not with my daughter's soulmate, and he's sad. But also have intense on the page. So finally, they are owls long enough that they can go to the door of wisdom, finally meet this woman who the voice has been guiding them the entire time. It turns out that it has something to do with archons. Oh. This is the piece of wisdom that they gave to the slugs to somehow get to humanity, to somehow teach us how to escape the evil prison. Or something. The, the, the woman's voice? Yep. But the slugs didn't even know about it, so yep. how, is, how is it supposed to help them? It's not supposed to help the slugs. It's supposed to help the humans. The slugs are supposed to somehow carry it over here. Uh, okay. So, <clears throat> that all happens. Also, um, while Arthur is unconscious, his wife finds his symphonies that he wrote when he was like getting divine inspiration. These are huge. Make big splashes. He's a huge success. He wakes up from this coma and everyone's happy. He does finally, after getting past the owl phase, wake up from his coma. He wakes up in the hospital. And his wife loves him again because now he's making real music and he's successful. And he's like, I love you too because you were an owl. Except I don't love you because you're not my daughter, but fine. Whatever. Uh, I'm okay with this. So, they remove the thing from the back of his head, the tumor, right? The tumor was the alien slug battery. Yep. The aliens don't care about this anymore. The alien slugs gave up on their mission to improve humanity. Because everything that happened with Arthur in VR was so entertaining that they just decided to make alien slug popcorn, eat it, record it, and now they're going to sell a Cinema Verite production back on their slug homeworld and be rich. <laughs> Genius plan. <laughs> so the slugs just leave the story. So, they legit gave up. Now, the slug's battery thing wakes up in the disposal bin and went, shit, the slug's left me here, I'm fucked. Also, this slug thing happens to be from the Archons. Okay. Out of nowhere, turns out the government is made out of bad Archons. And there are three lines of dialogue we get. The head Archon says, we must destroy the battery. The other guy says, we will destroy it. The other one says, no, you will retrieve it. Verbatim the lines in quotes. That's all we hear from the bad guys. Great. So now they are hunting this alien battery so they can destroy the last hope for humanity to escape the prison mentioned at the beginning of the book. Yes. Is that as well written as the entire book is? Yes. 
Okay, so this battery suddenly escapes and is like, shit, the only way I can, like, move quickly is to attach to a human host, so it just runs to the first human it can find. There are these humans laying down in beds that don't seem to be moving, so they're probably easy targets. It ends up in the mental ward. Accidentally ends up in the head of a schizophrenic drug addict. Violently escapes and runs away. Now the slug is giving this schizophrenic guy all of the messages that he needs to like start proclaiming the truth. So he's shouting the truth about the bad archons on the street corner. Nobody's listening to him. Sweet! Uh, bad guys chase after him and in the process they find Arthur and his wife and his daughter. Because Arthur was unconscious for so long and not making movie scores, they lost their house. I would like to mention, they lived in a mansion. Uh, Arthur spends the entire book talking about how much he hates his mansion oh, no. and how he really just wants to go to the apartment where he has this random mistress who reminds him of his daughter that he sleeps with. Naturally. Yes. Now that they can't afford the mansion anymore, uh, he can't pay the mistress, the mistress moves out and they all move in in the old apartment he used to fuck her in. The uh, government guys come into the apartment, ruin everything, realize you don't have the battery, they leave. So, they track down the homeless guy, but the homeless guy is always one step ahead of them. Until finally the thing realizes, you know what, maybe I should try not being inside an insane homeless guy. So the plasmate, battery, bug, name changes depending on the page, leaves the homeless man, scurries away, and then sprays mind control liquid on the Archon agents, turning them good agents. Um... The day is saved. But now, that's the rest of the battery's energy, so the battery's gonna die. So the battery crawls through a warm heat grate and you know, dies in the warmth. Meanwhile, remember how Arthur Gimli was famous now? He's like, shit, I need money, so I'm just gonna go give speeches and hopefully raise enough money that way. And then I'm gonna use that money to make an opera, and I'm gonna use this opera to tell the world about the bad archons and free humanity, yes. Are you Arthur? No. So, <laughs> Arthur. Uh, goes to a Berkeley University. Yeah. Gives a speech and he says, Ahem, music is literally magic. You can cast spells with music. And the audience boos him and he cries. <laughs> so then he leaves and he's like completely distraught. He's like, shit, there's no hope for humanity at all. But he runs into the homeless man from earlier. This homeless man has a sign that says music is magic. And he goes, I get you! We're the same! I believe music is magic! And homeless goes, you're fucking crazy. What do you mean music is magic? Get the fuck away from me. <laughs> Book ends. <laughs> Wait, he still has the thing in his head. Nope. But how is he how is he how is he reading the sign wrong? <laughs> I can't believe this. So, as you can see, reading this book, we've learned that there really is no deep secret to Owl in Daylight. So, why was it burned so passionately? Well, we don't know for sure. But remember when the PKD estate was made up of a bunch of, like, Philip Kiddick's, um, kids, kind of? Yeah. All of the women in this book are very clearly some of Philip Kiddick's early wives. Tessa Dick! Right, every other woman Philip Dick was involved in as this, like, bitch, horrible person. So, they're probably just like, we don't want this slander out there. Screw you, Tessa Dick. And that's why they chose the book. So, what is the big takeaway from all of this? Yes. Take drugs, be God. <laughs> that, that's one. Okay, yeah, alright. I think the other thing <laughs> worth noting is that yeah. Philip K. Dick had a really, really kind of messed up life. And even though this balancing doesn't sound good, this did kind of help it kind of help him get together. Yeah, I wanted I wanted to say, because I feel like throughout all of the like not to not to be false to you, but, <laughs> but like throughout all the insanity of this, like, it, it feels like catharsis. <laughs> the message of all of these books is that the time of trouble is over now that I met God and now I just need to understand the goodness of the world. <laughs> Phil K. Dick, through writing these books, got off hard drugs and in a lot of ways started getting things together. He had his first, because he writes entire things in his diary about how much he loves Tessa. 
how great their relationship is now. He's able to build his first solid relationship. <laughs> and despite all of the ridiculous bullshit and um, spiteful things about other wives, this is a very loving yeah. homage to everything about Philip K. Dick. Um, the story about Arthur Grimley is a retold version of kind of Philip K. Dick's growing up. And it's constantly just kind of celebrating, this was a flawed guy, but I loved him, and I loved his imagination and his work. Also, Tessa Dick doesn't write these intellectual conversations like Philip Kiddick does. She just writes, and then they had an intellectual conversation, period. And honestly, I feel like that's the perfect way to end this book, because a lot, or end the Vallas series. Because a lot of these Vallas books kind of like are about how you get stuck in these intellectual Berkeley rabbit holes trying to understand the divine nature of God. And the truth is, it's okay. And I feel like Tessa Dick covers that in a weird way that none of these books ever did. So in a weird sense, I actually think this is the best Ballast book. Okay. So the big takeaway is, <clears throat> even if Phil Kiddick did a lot of drugs and didn't literally encounter God, he encountered him in some way. There's some sort of spiritual thing that really did change him, and that is real. Okay. <laughs> Fast, active, living, intelligent system. Uh, that makes sense. All right. The comics. Fast, active, living, intelligent system. Okay. Phil K. Knight never really nails down what exactly Vallis is. Every night in his exegesis, in his hundred pages, he just starts from scratch and comes up with a new theory about where the world and everything comes from, and where God is and what it is. And sometimes it's very clearly him trying to like deal with his trauma through his interpretation of God. His first idea is that. God used to be two halves, a man and a woman, and the woman killed herself, and God never got over the woman killing herself, and God is miserable, and God just needs to get over his grief so the universe can be okay. Okay. And there's a, lo there's a lot of things like that. The comic. So the comic is the... It's a famous black and white comic that tells the story of the 1974 incident. It is generally considered like the most accurate telling of what happened. Until I read this exegesis and discovered that none of this was true, yeah. this was the big source. Yeah. Okay, um, wait, so wait, Vallis is more accurate than exegesis or vice versa? Yeah. Exegesis is the diary where I found everything in. Vallis comic is based on everything we knew before I was able to read this and figure out what really happened. And exegesis is Okay, so the exegesis is the most accurate version. Yes. Alright, where does the Vallis comic come from, do we know? Yeah, just a, a fan compiler. All right. Well, that's cool. The Valus video game. 2016. There is a game called Californium, and even though it never technically references Valus, it's clearly the aesthetic of Philip K. Dick uh, dealing with his drug addictions and trying to come up, or trying to deal with needing God. In the book, he's ripping over other realities in his world, and it actually shares the most in common with Owl and Daylight. So it's possible the makers of this game read this. All right. Which also brings me to what is the future of Valus? I really think Valus is done. I, I think Valus. Yeah. I think it is. It's, it's, it's not going to be. It's not going. But it should be. Yeah. Valus is a story of a very very fucked up person coming to something that was kind of a better version of himself in a very weird way. Yes. Now, Philip K. Dick was constantly paranoid about government conspiracies, and as you can kind of see, his internal worries kind of projected into the world around him. Because the story of Alice is kind of Philip K. Dickian in and of itself with all of this over here. So this is really Philip K. Dick's story and the world reacting to that. But because Philip K. Dick is still really, really big, people are constantly looking for new stuff of his to adapt. And really, we're getting to the point where the only things left are the Vallis books. Oh, no. <laughs> Multiple pitches for Vallis have been made. The reason that Radio Free Album Month was made was PKD State was testing the water to find out, okay, can we merchandise this? One of the reasons this did so poorly was because it had no budget, and instead of focusing on fascist dystopia, the whole thing is a love triangle between the uh, Sylvia, the wife and the guy who met Dallas in Ready for Real Love. <laughs> so, probably what's going to happen is Dallas is slowly going to get diluted into rom com dramas. Oh no! The most rom -com likely adaptation I think is Transmigration of Timothy Archer. So, I think 
the best thing you can do for Valis is just not fucking feeding to it. Any other lingering questions? What is Valis? Demerit. <laughs> How much is All right. that sex? This has been Shock University. Uh, do drugs become the ruler of the universe? Phil Kinnick. Do understand, mechanical hand. No one, okay. <laughs>